a well. Welcome back everybody to the Dolly Cooking Show, to the Dolly Cooking Stream. I hope you're all having a beautiful Friday. If you're watching this live, it is currently 5 p.m. EDT. Hello, hello, hello. It's good to see all of you. Welcome on into Tarina. Hello to Holkin. Hello to Death Coil. Hello to Kishma. Hello to Les. Hello to Trash Can Cat Mom. Hello to Magazines Attack. Hi, it's good to see all of you. I'm sorry that I scared you magazines. Uh, as you may know, New York had an earthquake today. On the list of things that are supposed to happen, uh, that's not one of them. Rather, the rest of the Northeast did. So it was pretty funny. Like, we're fine. We're like, we're, we're chill. We're hanging out. Also, hi to Jack. Don't worry. I didn't forget. Just the chat ended up scrolling past. Also, hello to Paris and hello to Zlo the Meek. Welcome on in. Hi, 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 hi. So, um, I'm a little sleepy today. I'm a little bit off. Uh, but hopefully I do chew up a little bit as we do actually get into the swing of things. Today might just be a slightly more low energy stream today. So welcome on in. We're just going to keep on waiting for everybody to pour on in. Today we're going to be doing a dish that we've done on stream maybe like three months ago. Something like that. And we'll talk about why we're doing this. Also, hello to Just Crazy Cookie. Um, I'm going to have a little sip of water before we begin. Okay, okay. Hi. Also, hello to John Dahlia. Welcome on in. So, my friends, today we're going to be doing what I think is one of the most ideal home soups, and we'll talk about why I've specifically chosen this one today. My friends, we will be harnessing the powers of a butternut squash today and making a really, really beautiful butternut squash soup. I love my root vegetables. I love my squashes, right? I love my pumpkins. They're nice and sweet. They get nice and creamy when they get roasted and blended down. This beautiful butternut squash. Yes, Jack, I'm okay. Don't have to worry about that. We have this beautiful butternut squash, guys. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. This is the, I'm doing the thumbnail pose. You know, something like that. Um, and so, guys, this bad boy right here, we're going to peel him up. We're going to roast him. And so today's soup is not just a butternut squash soup. We're doing a roasted butternut squash soup. Uh, these kinds of vegetables lend themselves so well to roasting. You don't have to do this if you're looking for a much more cleaner taste. Uh, you could theoretically just boil this and also be fine with it. Um, but I'm going to be doing a roasted butternut squash soup. So it's a little bit more effort, but we'll be able to get so many deeper, more caramelized, sweet flavors out of it as a result. So one big butternut squash is going to be the basis of today. And then also going into the soup, guys, is going to be the one and only mille pois. Guys, this is your basis of so many different soups and sauces that you see all the time, especially used in French cooking. We have carrots, we have celery, and we have some onions. The carrots are gonna get roasted, the celery and the onions will be sauteing down, and then everything is going to get blended into a beautiful creamy soup. And we'll talk about exactly how to process and break those down. So the reason I've chosen this specific dish for today, guys, is because I have this. I have a bunch of half and half that I wanted to get rid of. Half and half is equal parts heavy cream and equal parts milk. I accidentally bought this the other day when I was shopping for heavy cream, uh, and half and half is kind of an annoying ingredient. There's not a lot that you can do with it. It's not as stable or as thickening as heavy cream, but then it's also not as light as plain milk. Typically, a half and half is only used for coffee, and so, why did I want to do the soup today? It's because it'd be a really nice way for me to get rid of a bunch of this half and half. Because it's going to go super well into a nice creamy soup where we don't just need heavy cream, but we need both heavy cream and milk. Milk to thin it out, cream it to make it nice and thick. Okay, so we're going to be using plenty of this bad boy right here. And then guys, the second thing that I wanted to use up today is this. I have here a mountain of parsley. I have a bunch of fresh, delicious parsley, some fresh flat leaf parsley. And that is going to go both into the salad that we're doing today, as well as a garnish for the soup. And so that's the goal of today, my friends. The goal of today is to use up all of these different existing leftovers that I may have, just so that they don't go to waste. I don't want to waste the things that I have in my fridge, and I'm here to show off how to use up these different kinds of produce, specifically the dairy and the parsley. Um, and then guys, we'll be doing a lovely cherry tomato salad. The reason why I love tomato salads like these is because they hold in the fridge exceptionally well. I want to be constantly building up a collection uh, of different fridge salads. Guys, I work in the city three times a week. I'm packing my lunches three times a week now, and thus I want to have things in my fridge that would be really nice and easily portable. And so we'll be doing a really, really beautiful cherry tomato salad. And this cherry tomato salad is, of course, going to feature a bunch of these delicious Kalamata olives from my Turkish grocery store. 
Okay, so we'll be getting some of these bad boys inside. And then we'll also have some red peppers, of course. We have two red bell peppers here. Uh, you can use yellow ones, you can use orange ones. I wouldn't use green ones because they're really vegetal tasting. I mean, so guys, this salad is super freeform. The salad is entirely up to you at the end of the day on how you actually want to do it. I'm just going to show you the bones, the basics of this kind of a salad. John, you've asked me what is the fat percentage on a half and half. Uh, I believe it's like 12%, something like that. Okay, and so, everybody, before we begin, do we have any questions before we get started? For anybody who's just joining in, welcome on in. We're doing a butternut squash soup. We're also going to be doing a beautiful tomato salad today. We have a lot of stuff to get done. We have a lot of prep coming up ahead of us. As always, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, I want you to ask them. I'm here to help you, that's you, I'm here to help you learn how to cook. So, before we, be we begin, I want to hear a nice, resounding yes, chef, from everybody watching. Please and thank you. Uh, and so, also before we begin, for those of you that haven't already done so, please check out my Patreon. You can type in exclamation mark Patreon in the chat, uh, or you can just scroll down, go into my About section. Any and all help that would be appreciated because I would love to be able to do this full time one day. And so, guys, without further ado, we have to begin. And the first step of today is going to be getting all of my delicious roasted vegetables out of the way. Also, thank you, Chunky Yogurt. I appreciate it. And everything is going to start, guys, with the butternut squash and the vessel that it will sit in, aka a nice large seat. Uh, sheet tray. So why are we doing this step? Well, let me explain. Butternut squash in of itself has so much sugar and so much starch, it lends itself so well to getting nice and roasted and beautiful in the oven. Right, so when we cube it up, when we toss it with some oil to help lubricate it, put it into the oven, we're going to get this really delicious, crispy, roasted, deep, sweet butternut squash. This step is not essential. If you want, you could just boil all of these ingredients at the end of the day. But I want to give it a little bit of extra love. So, you can sacrifice a little bit of flavor for some ease of access. And so everybody, let's go ahead and begin prepping my butternut squash. And so the first things that we're going to need, guys, is going to be a nice big peeler, okay? So, take a look. This is a butternut squash. It's pretty huge. Uh, there's quite a bit to process here. So we're going to need a nice sharp peeler to be able to go ahead and process all of this. Um, and in fact, I'm thinking that I might want to just start by cutting it in half like this um, because the way that we sort of peel the thinner end and the bulbous end might be a little bit different. So I think that's actually what I'm going to start with. Nice little butternut squash, and then I'm just going to go ahead and just cut it right through this. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is just to make the process of the peeling a little bit easier. And as always, guys, I have a waste bowl ready to go where we will be dumping out all the trash and all the different scraps. Okay, so here's the two halves of my butternut squash food today. I don't know if I will necessarily be using all of this as well, by the way, because we do have quite a bit to get through. Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? So, let's get that sticker off. Let's, uh, you know, I think I want to glove up through this because butternut squash can get a little bit slimy, especially as you do start like cutting into it instead of peeling it. So some gloves will be able to help with some traction. Also, Dakota, welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. Okay, now, so, uh, my gloves on. Perfect, beautiful. How am I doing, Jack? I'm doing pretty okay today. I'm a little sleepy. And, and so guys, all that we're going to do, we're just going to go through all the way with our peeler. And you see, this is why it's much nicer to be able to first cut this in half, instead of us trying to peel this entire mass of butternut squash by first cutting it in half. We have a little bit of easier access into the actual skin itself, and it becomes a lot more manageable. So we've just made it a little bit easier on ourselves. Okay? So we're just going through this, and I'm going down the full length of the vegetable, I'm going down the full length of the squash. I see that we have a couple of bad spots here, so I'm just peeling that away as well. And I'm really just looking to get all of like that beige white skin off of it. So you see like how we did a little peel here? I'm going to go then a little bit deeper, because that part can still be a little papery and a little flavorless. Okay, so just going through all of this. How many would this meal typically serve? I mean, at least six to eight portions, I have to say, for an entire butternut squash. And I'm still contemplating if I want to use an entire one. I might just go ahead and cube some up and then leave it for the next day. So guys, this starts to get a little slippery, a little slimy at this stage. But yeah, Sunny Peach Crush, uh, let me tell you, one of these butternut squashes, it makes quite a few portions of soup. The answer is numerous. And so, this is also a fairly cheap vegetable. This is why this is also really, really ideal home food. This is a kind of a produce that you can buy a week in advance. It's not going to go bad laying around unless you really want it to, right? And then, by the end of it, it just purees so well, it goes so well, there's so many uses for it. I don't think enough people actually actively cook with squash. And so, 
I do believe that we've got that all cleaned up now. I'm just going to go ahead and just slice off the head of the butternut squash as well, because we have no use for him. And that's one of the halves nicely and beautifully peeled. And now I'm still thinking, do I actually want to process all of that squash? Uh, we'll decide in a second. We'll figure it out in a second. So again, it gets like a little slimy, it gets a little icky, and this is why we cut it in half. And now we're going to go through and do this one as well. I'm just trying to figure out my best peeling technique. It's a little difficult because it's so bulbous. So I'm holding my peeler nice and sharp. And guys, this would also be a really good time for questions because this process is innately a little repetitive. It's a little bit boring. Not the most interesting thing in the kitchen, I think. Are the skins worth keeping frozen for the vegetable broth? Really good question, chunky yogurt. I would say no. Typically with really starchy vegetables, uh, I'm thinking butter not squash, I'm thinking, you know, like a potato, I don't think they would actually contribute that much into a broth. Okay, Ugh. Guys, this bulbous part, this is the really difficult one to actually get like a good, whoa, what is my camera doing? Has my camera always been doing this? Pal, buddy, are you okay? Okay, and let's just keep going. Through. What is happening? Does it just not like that bowl? Chill out, man. Every time I put this bowl down and then I put this in here, the whole shot just gets so overexposed and I have absolutely no idea why. And then it sees the orange and then it's all fine again. I don't know what's going on with this camera today, guys. I don't know. It's a little bit upsetting. So you know what? Let's just go ahead and get this peeling process done with so that we don't have to worry about it anymore, okay? Just get it done as fast as possible. I'm just pivoting and I'm twisting and I'm getting as much of this stuff off as possible. As much of it off as humanly possible, guys. Okay. Ugh. There you go. Almost done. I apologize for how long this is taking, such is the life of squash. It's big and it's bulbous, and thus it is not the easiest thing to peel in the world. Okay, and why are we peeling it? Because the skins are pretty flavor flavorless, they're a little papery as well. They're not going to blend up too nice, right? So it just does not make for good eating. Okay. And we're almost done, guys. Again, I just want to get all this papery stuff off, every single last bit of it off here. Almost done. Ugh. This is a bit of a hassle. I apologize for how this camera looks right now. Yeah, it is not happy with the squash. It is just not happy with it. It's had enough. Okay, how am I looking? Almost done, guys. A couple more peels, and then we'll cut the bottom of this off. Beautiful. Okie dokie, take a look. So we have all of that now nicely and beautifully peeled. And all that we're going to do, guys, we're just going to go ahead and slice off the bottom of Mr. Squash here. There you go. The bottom comes off, and then we're going to need to split this bottom end so that we can actually get nice, easy access into all of those seeds on the inside. So we're going to go ahead and cut this in half now. And that is easier said than done, by the way. Butter not squashes are pretty notoriously tough to get through sometimes. Also, hello, Keo, welcome on in. So now we have that section halved out. Uh, we're going to be scooping out all the stuff from the inside. Uh, what I like doing, guys, is I like getting a spoon and a paring knife simultaneously. Okay, and so the paring knife is going to do a really nice job of first trimming off the fibers. So a little paring knife. All that I'm going to do, I'm going to take Mr. Squash here, and we're just going to go through here and almost carve out the majority of it, scrape it out. And then a spoon does a really nice job of scooping it up. Would I bother using the seeds for anything? Well, I don't typically make like roasted pumpkin seeds, although I'm pretty sure you could do that with butternut squash seeds and it'd be delicious. I don't, I just simply discard it. Into the trash, all of it goes. So guys, again, so take a look. Using both the paring knife and the spoon in conjunction, we're able to get all of those seeds out and all of these little weird fibers out that would not be particularly good eating either. So. Just going through all of this. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect. We're just not looking for any big chunks of seeds. We're not looking for any like big sort of webs of the butternut squash fibers on the inside. But yeah, I don't really have much uses for the seeds. So I just kind of end up cleaning it up and discarding it. Butternut squash, guys, it takes a little bit of prep, but I promise you it will well be worth it. So that's the first one done. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing with this other half. 
So all I'm going is I'm going inside and I'm just sort of scraping everything up. Okay, and now that the paring knife did most of the work, all that we're going to go ahead and do is we're just gonna grab a spoon and scoop out the rest. Beautiful. Okay, that's that, and a little bit more. Same exact idea as carving a pumpkin, guys, right? Just scooping it out, scooping all these little fibers out, all of them hairy and stringy that will not make for optimal eating, at least for today's usage. Because the entire idea, guys, is for this to get nicely and beautifully all blended up together. Okay, so that is now officially the butternut squash that has now been prepped. We have broken it down into all of its different components. This is the neck, this was the bulb. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the spoon really quickly and I'm going to wash off my knife uh, because that is a carbon steel knife and it will rust if I leave it dirty and wet by itself. So I'm just gonna rinse off all of the squash from it. So I just need a quick little second to do that, get that done because we're not going to immediately go into cutting it quite yet. We still have another thing to do. Okay, okay. Uh, what do I do with the vegetable scraps? So, uh, Takash, ideally, I would be composting them. I simply put them into the trash. So, eh, you know, not the best, probably not the least wasteful. There isn't a lot of usage for the butternut squash fibers. Again, the seeds you could probably do like roasted seeds with and it'd still be like pretty delicious. Um, and then some vegetable scraps are good for stocks. In the case of the squash, I would not argue that that is an optimal broth scrap of any kind. So in my case, I just throw them away. Okay, so that's that, all nicely and prepped and ready to go. And now guys, we're going to go ahead and do basically the same exact thing with the carrot, except there's nothing to scoop out with the carrot. Um, I am just going to go ahead and set these bad boys behind me and we'll come back to them in just a second. We just wanna peel up our carrots. And so, the carrots, I don't want them to be the main attraction of today's soup, guys. The carrots are just there to add a little bit of extra robustness, to be able to add an extra, like, deeper quality to it, so it's not so one note and only tastes like butter, not squash. Now, you can also add parsnips, you can add other kinds of root vegetables. The carrot addition is not even essential, right? It is just because I already have some, and I thought this would be a nice, cute way of using a couple of them up. So does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? I'm going down the length of the carrot, right? Getting a nice good peel on it. These are just like two small to medium carrots, right? They're not particularly thick. Also, hello, shark dog. Welcome on in. Hope you're having a beautiful day today. And hi, scroblo. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. And I'm just peeling up the carrot that has now been officially taken care of. Let's do the same exact thing with this other one. Beautiful. Um... Yeah, that's okay, Zumalavo. It's lovely to have you. It's been, a, it's been a little bit. Welcome on in. We're doing a beautiful butternut squash soup today. So we're just getting some carrots peeled through that. We're getting all of the vegetable prep done and ready to go. Okie dokie. And let's just go ahead and continue peeling, 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 peeling. Again, we just gave these carrots a very light rinse. Uh, and I don't keep the skins because they're a little papery and not that optimal for blending. And so I'm just trimming off the heads and I'm trimming off the dried off tips and into the waste bowl. Always, 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 always have a separate waste bowl so that you have an intermediary between this and the trash can. If we were peeling over the trash can, we'd be breaking our back. Just dirty another bowl, dirty another waste bowl, and I promise you it's going to change your life. And so guys, now, the other thing that I'm going to need is I'm going to need a nice big bowl to be able to accommodate all of my soon-to-be chopped up vegetables. So, hi chef, bye chef. Well, hello Kaze, goodbye Kaze. Welcome on in. Hope you're having a beautiful day today. Let's go ahead and get this waste bowl out of here because we don't have an immediate use for them at the moment. And now guys, we're looking for um, just some chunks of carrot. We're going to be roughly cutting the carrot and the butternut squash uh, to a similar width to a similar thickness here. And so I'm just trying to think about the best way to really go about this. I wanna just have nice two flat sides. So this is what I'm gonna do, right? Nice big chunks, guys. Nice big, big, big chunks of carrot. The entire idea is not to actually fully cook through the carrots. The whole idea is just to get them nicely and beautifully caramelized and browned. So we cut up our carrot into rounds and all I'm going to do is I'm going to throw into my nice big bowl here. And now let's go ahead and process one of my chunks of butternut squash. 
And so guys, we're going through the same exact thickness. We're going through the same exact width here. So all that I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and slice this bad boy in half lengthwise, set it down, make sure that you have a nice stable surface. And um, you know, this is the reality with, with cutting butternut squash, by the way, it can be a massive headache sometimes. So you do have to sometimes just brute force it. Right, so let's just pick up a knife and adjust it slightly. It is stuck in there, right? Because it is such a hard vegetable. It does not want to be cut. And there we go. And so we do have this little teeny tiny pocket, which I'm going to probably dig out. What is that? Is that mold on the inside? It's kind of white and fuzzy. I don't think it is. It could just be uh, like another like seed pocket. I have no idea what we've just uncaved. Typically the neck of it doesn't really have anything inside of it though. I don't think it's mold because it wouldn't just be white in that case. I think it's just another seed pocket. Yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and lift it up and trim it off and into my waste bowl. Yeah, just like that. And that's why it's really nice and it really pays to have a nice paring knife on hand. Okay, so get rid of it. Get that done, get that out of here. Just two incisions all the way through, okay? Lift it up, and we're almost done with it. We're just carving it out. Okay, and I think that should be fine. Alrighty, guys. So let's, also, hi, Trey. Welcome on in. So guys, all that we're going to do now is we're just going to roughly cut this to the same size as my carrots. Although, again, it's not, doesn't have to be really that perfect because, again, the the goal isn't to actually get everything cooked through evenly. The goal is just to get them all nicely and beautifully browned. And so we're going to go ahead and take this and now cut this up. Once we've cut to lengths, nice big cubes here, roughly the same size or maybe even bigger than the carrots were. Okay. Boop. And it just kind of sticks to your knife and you just have to be okay with it. Guys, it's butter not squash. It's hard and it's sticky and sometimes it's a little slimy too. But just get it done. Get that process done. It sticks on, it adheres, just pop it off. Beautiful. And now let's use my favorite tool, my handy dandy little bench scraper, and get all of that into my bowl. And let's do the same exact thing with the other half. Also, hi WW, welcome on in. Let's do the same exact thing with this other half, guys. So we just take it and we set it down, and then we just cut this bad boy into some lengths. Okie dokie. And now into some lovely little cubes. Okay. There you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. And so, by the way, this is something that I wanna show all of you. There's a reason why I'm putting this into a bowl before we actually put it onto the sheet tray. So let me go ahead and demonstrate something for you guys. This is what I think one of the biggest cooking mistakes that will actually cause quite a bit of a headache. The thing that I hate most is seeing people go ahead and they're like, okay, it's time to put this in the oven. So they take it and they dump all of it onto the sheet tray they dump all the vegetables onto the sheet tray and then they season it and oil it that way. When you do it that way, the issue is, is that you're not going to get even covering, you're not going to get an even coating of oil on everything. When you do that, you're going to get splotches of oil and splotches of seasoning. You'll have parts that stick and burn and then you'll have parts that are completely unseasoned. And so, even though this does cause you to dirty another bowl, I do think it is optimal to first have everything in a bowl and then we're going to toss it with our seasonings. Specifically, again, our oven is at 425 degrees. We're just going to be doing some olive oil um, and some salt and pepper, nothing too crazy. Uh, just for a little bit of flavor and to help extract the moisture from it. So again, guys, we're going to be separately, separately tossing this. So the first step is going to be getting it nicely lubricated with oil. The oil is going to, first of all, is going to help it to properly evenly cook in the oven, but then it's also going to be the thing that helps the seasonings to stick. So the first goal, guys, again, and I do want it generously, generously covered in oil. I want all of it. This is the glue that holds all of this together. And ideally, you'd use a slightly larger bowl. You want a little bit more negative space inside because when you have this little space, you're not able to get an optimal toss. So I'm just going to do like a two-handed toss. Okay. Right, just tossing it up and down just to make sure that all of it is nicely and beautifully covered in oil. Okie dokie. So now that it's nicely and beautifully covered in oil, guys, all that I'm going to go ahead and do is we're going to generously hit this with a bunch of salt and then we're going to toss it all the way together, right? So a little pinch of salt now and then we just mix this in a little bit. Right, some big tosses. Beautiful, and now 
Let's do another big pinch. We want this to be properly seasoned, everybody. We want this to be properly and beautifully salted. And again, the black pepper I might not even add because we're still gonna have plenty of black pepper in the soup itself. All I'm really looking to do is just get it properly seasoned, have all of the salt penetrate the vegetables, and for it to really help facilitate extracting the moisture from it as it cooks. Okay, so now that we have this beautiful coating, right, all of the butternut squash is now evenly covered in all that salt. Uh, what's the difference between a big pinch and a little pinch? Uh, death Owl is purely relative to how big of a pinch I'm taking with how many fingers I'm using. So I don't know if I can give you much more specifics past that. And so I'm like looking at the other two butternut squash halves. This might be a lot and it might make a lot of soup food today. So I'm going to just put this onto the sheet tree and see how much we have. And then I'll decide how much more we want to process. So let's just go ahead and get all of this now from nice and up high, just dumped onto the sheet tray. And we're looking to make sure that all of my beautiful vegetables, guys, that they have a nice amount of space in between them. Okay, we do not want them to be all bunched up together. If they're all bunched up together, it's because uh, what's going to happen is they're just going to end up steaming instead of properly roasting them. So I'm just taking a second, I'm organizing the sheet tray, and in fact, I don't think I wanna push this specific sheet tray any further. We don't wanna load this up with any more vegetables. The negative space is essential. They need their space, okay? You don't want your kids to grow up 10 of them in the same room, ideally, right? You want them all to have their own little bit of space and that way they can flourish. If they're all together, they're just gonna steam. Same thing with raising children, I think. So everybody needs their space. Let's go ahead and just move them around a little bit. And so now is my dilemma. Do I make another sheet tray of chopped up vegetables or do I just call it a day? And that is what I need to decide right now in the moment. Hmm. I think this looks like plenty of vegetables for today's butternut squash soup. Um, I feel pretty content with like this amount of butternut squash. Um, I mean, yeah, let's do another sheet tray. Let's do another one, guys. All right, so let's go ahead and get that ready then. I am just going to move this one aside slightly. Let's get my second sheet tray out. And I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna just line it with foil just to make my life a little bit easier. Let's do another sheet tray. This might end up making a lot of soup, but you know what? It's actually fine to have a lot of roasted vegetables, right? That's like always a, little, a delicious side dish. You can't really go wrong with it. So let me just go ahead and cover this bad boy up in some aluminum foil. And does anybody have any cooking questions for me in the meantime? I'm sorry if I'm like really low energy today. I feel like I'm 85% capacity for some reason. I think I might still be kind of getting over being sick. Uh, what happens if you eat too much iron? Uh, Jack, I have no idea. Perhaps iron poisoning. That would be my, my guess, if you could have too much iron. Okay, so let's go ahead and process up the rest of the butternut squash, guys. So same exact idea. Um, I'm doing uh, foil specifically. Not silicone, not like silpats or anything, just foil. Yes, it's going to be a creamy, it's gonna be a delicious soup today. So guys, I'm just gonna cut this bad boy into quarters. Oop. Come on, buddy. There you go. Into quarters, lovely. And now let's just go ahead and get this cubed up. And again, guys, it's going into a bowl before it actually goes onto the sheet tray. And it goes into a bowl first so that we can then properly ensure that all of my vegetables are nice and tossed. So get all of them on, all of them inside. There we go. And this process of roasting, it's substantial. It's going to be about 45 minutes of sheer roasting, guys. That's how long it's going to take to be able to get this job done because we have a lot of liquid to actually cook out of it. Okay. Oh, Jack, I, I, I did get it. Jack, I got it. Um, are we going to be adding an acid? No, there is no acid needed into today's soup. Um, can we let it sit a little bit with a bowl of salt to dry out the moisture? Uh, Death Owl, not in this case, because that method's only typically for raw cooking, right? And so if we're like making a salad, like we'll be doing that later today with the tomatoes, I don't think it's particularly useful with such a thick root vegetable like this. Okay, well, I don't know if squash is technically considered a root vegetable, but something so thick and starchy like that, I don't think it'll actually do anything. Okay. And nice big cubes, guys. Nice big cubes, nice big cubes. Lovely. 
And let's go ahead and do the next one. Uh, Audio Murphy, that sounds almost conspiratorial, although I don't know. Nice, big, 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 beautiful cubes. And again, it does not have to be perfect. All of these squashies are going to get blended down nonetheless. So guys, same exact idea, same exact treatment, okay? I'm just going to go ahead and wipe off my hands really quickly. We're going to slather these bad boys in some oil. Right, nice generous, generous amount of oil here. And then we're going to just give them a nice, big, generous toss, guys. Make sure that they're all properly coated. Ah! And not on my floor. That is not where I actually want them for today. Yes, Jack, they are. Okay. And again, I do want to emphasize having a slightly bigger bowl that will let you properly toss. That'll be okay. All right. So let's go ahead and do another big, big, big pinch of salt, guys, to make sure that all of my squash is nicely and beautifully seasoned. And again, this is why we do this in a bowl before we actually put it onto the sheet tray. If you don't do this like this and you do it onto the sheet tray first, what's going to happen is you're going to get a bunch of under-seasoned, unevenly seasoned butternut squash that doesn't actually have even oil lubrication. A bowl is a very nice way of combining and tossing different things. A sheet tray is a vessel that you cook on. Can I please get a yes chef? I do need to make sure that all of you understand this concept. And so, same exact idea. I'm just laying it out, I'm pouring it out. I'm going to go ahead and get this bad boy into my dishwasher in the meantime, just so that this isn't hanging around and wasting my space. And I'm just gonna rinse off my hands. Does everybody understand? I need to make sure that all of you do. Chef, uh, can you do a flip with a bowl like fried rice? Yes, only if you don't overfill it. So see, beyond my issue was is that I overfilled it. And so I wasn't able to give it a proper, uh, you know, toss. So guys, my friends, take a look. We have these two sheet trays. One of them has the carrots and the butternut squash. The other just has the butternut squash in it. And all that I'm going to do really quickly is I'm just going to go ahead and spread them around because again, we're looking for this to lay nice and flat. We don't want them to be touching. We don't want them, you know, to uh, be too close together because then they will just end up steaming and not roasting. So we want them to get nice and delicious and roasted and browned. And in order to facilitate that evaporation of water, they need their space, everybody. They need their space. So let's give them that space. Let's give it to them now. There you go. Let's break it all up, break up these little clusters. There you go, everybody, nice and separated. And so, 425 degree oven. Total cook time is gonna be about 45 minutes on them. And then we're going to flip them halfway through. So guys, I am going to go ahead and get these things into the oven right now. Each of my lovely sheet trays. In one goes, and in goes the second one. There we go. And I'm gonna set my timer to, oh boy, they don't fit all together, do they? Okay, that's fine. That's a little bit annoying. So I'm just going to move this down a little bit. And I'm just going to have them bake on two separate racks, I suppose. That's the best way to do it. Okay. And just like that. And now these bad boys are going to go in for about 25 minutes or so. Serena, I'm really glad to hear it. I'm glad that the spätzle went well. So, kitchen timer. 22 minutes. That's when we're going to check on it and give these bad boys a little flip. It will take time. Do not rush this process. Because of how wet they are, they will take a substantial amount of time for us to build up any amount of caramelization on it. We're not looking to just get these things cooked through. We're looking to get them perfectly crispy, nice and golden brown, and nice and roasted and delicious, my friends. So I'm just quickly washing off my chef's knife once again, because again, it is a carbon steel knife and it was cutting up the squash. So I just wanna go ahead and thoroughly dry it. And now I'm going to take a second just to clean up my station. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me? Oof. Why am I feeling so sleepy pilled at the moment? I'm like a little sleepier than usual and I don't know what's going on and I do not love it, admittedly. Ah, <sighs> we'll power through it, right? We'll be okay, I hope so. Just gonna take a second and wipe off my station just to clean everything up. It's the weather, yeah. It's also, you know, the earthquake and the fact that it's been storming. Everything is collapsing, everything is falling apart. How's everybody doing? You guys hanging in there? But yeah, uh, Tarina, I didn't know that you could use a potato geyser. I felt like a potato geyser for spätzle would be too thin. Um, also, I just caught my microphone on my door again. This does keep happening. 
Um, do I know any Benny Hanna tricks? No, because uh, that would be a little embarrassing. Sorry to look down on Benny Hanna, but what it sort of stands for in, in the United States and what hibachi stands for in the, you know, impressing white people is very annoying to me. Hey, Samim, welcome on in. It's lovely to have you. Okay, so I got my knife nicely and beautifully dried off now. Just making sure that it has no wet spots on it or anything, because of the, again, because I do have a carbon steel knife, you typically have a stainless steel knife. Um, you know, mine does uh, have the risk of rusting at any given moment, so gotta keep it nice and dry. So, let me go and have a little sip of water. Jack, I'm very happy for you. I'm glad it went well. Mm. Okay, my friends, so, we have the butternut squash for today's butternut squash soup inside of the oven at the moment. It's roasting at 425 degrees. And now we have to talk about the rest of the components for the soup because the squash is not the only component that we'll actually have for today. And so the other two things that we need to do guys is we need to get our onions processed and our celery processed. This is going to be the aromatic base of the soup today. It's going to make it really nice and really, really delicious. The onions are going to add a very nice allium quality, a very nice aromatic allium quality. And then uh, the celery is going to add a really nice herbaceous note as well. So. Everybody, if you do not own a bench scraper, this is one of my favorite tools for cleaning up a station because you can see that we have all these little scraps. So all I do is I just give the whole thing a little scoop and then I clean it up and into my waste bowl it goes. And that way I keep my cutting board nice and clean as we go. Okay, so guys, I have here two stalks of celery that I scrubbed up. Um, this is something that I love showing off anytime I am processing celery. Uh, this is not a step that you have to do if you're going to cook it, especially blend it, but one of my biggest issues with eating raw celery is I take a bite out of it and then you have all of these fibers. Mm, that's a good salad. You have all of these fibers, these fibers right here that get stuck in your teeth. They're super, super tough. They're super chewy. They're like guitar strings. And so what I like to do, also Liv, thank you so much for the raid. Welcome, welcome. Hope you had a really good stream today. We're doing some butternut squash soup. So all that I like to do with my raw celery, guys, is I like to go ahead and break off an end of it, okay? And then I just peel it back. And that way we get all of these little fibers that are normally, look how tough it is. Look how tough it is. Look how springy it is. Normally those fibers are so, so tough, so unpleasant. And again, this is really nice to go ahead and throw into a stock or anything, guys. But again, these fibers, we just take it from the bottom, especially with the white part, we take it and then we just gently, gently rip it off. And all of these fibers, guys, these are the things that can make a celery really unpleasantly toothsome in a way that it gets like stuck in your teeth. Okay? So, does anybody have any cooking questions for me in the meantime? Now, this is completely unnecessary for what I'm doing. I just wanted to be able to show this technique off. Okay? This is my favorite thing to do, especially if I'm serving raw celery or I'm chopping it up for a salad or something. This is just really, really good practice. And so guys, in today's soup, it is going to get all blended down, so we don't have to worry about like immaculate knife cuts today or anything. Um, and I can hear my butternut squash is beautifully roasting at the moment. Um, but yes, so we don't really need this to be like perfectly chopped. We don't need it to be perfectly cut or anything. Uh, this is all going to be blended down, but we still just want to be able to chunk it up to size. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to section this off. Then I'm just going to go ahead and cut each of these, you know, maybe into thirds, something like this. Just something that will be nice and sauteable. Oh, good word. I'm glad, I'm glad that my method has helped out a little bit. Okay, guys, so that's all we do. We just take it and then we chunk it up. And now small to medium dice. That's it. That's all the work that we really need to do for the celery. Okay, nice and easy and simple. And then we'll transfer this over to a bowl in just a moment's time. Good afternoon, good word. It's lovely to have you. Welcome, welcome. Okay. And then we'll get the celery and the onions cooking together. And we're going to get them nice and soft and nice and golden brown and delicious. And it's going to be lovely. Okay, there you go. And my last little bundle of celery, again, does not need to be perfect, especially because of the fact that we're blending it. If this was for the salad, I'd be paying a lot more attention to my knife cuts and making sure that each and every single one of them are as immaculate as they can be. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and get a transfer bowl ready to go for us. 
Let's get my cherry tomatoes squared away into a different container probably. So just one second please and thank you. I'll just be using this bowl because it's already been out and about. Okay, okay. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me whatsoever? Uh, I'm just gonna dry out that bowl really quick because it still has some of the water that drained out of the tomatoes. And guys, we're gonna go ahead and take a nice big, big, big scoop and all of the celery. And again, if you're not using a bench scraper, you're making a mistake. One of the most convenient and easy to use tools to have in a kitchen setting that you can use for so many different things. Everybody just needs one of these. I don't wanna see you using the side of your knife. You're going to end up dulling, especially if you have a wooden cutting board, you're going to end up dulling the knife. Chef, can you use, can you use cucumber slices to view the solar eclipse? Audio Murthy, I'm not entirely sure that you can. I apologize. I don't wanna give you bad slash dangerous advice. Any recommendations on knife sharpeners? So Samim, it depends on the knife that you have. If you have really good knives, getting a collection of different whetstones would be probably the best way to go. I don't own them because I get mine professionally sharpened. I do wanna take a knife sharpening class at some point though. Best oil for cutting boards. Uh, Death Owl, I believe, I don't know. I don't know what the standard is because I don't oil my cutting boards. This is an epic, what is happening with my lighting today? My camera does not like me today. It is being incredibly, incredibly fussy. Hello, Hannah, welcome on in. Uh, so best oil for cutting blades, I don't oil mine, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, mineral oil, yeah, I think that's what people do on like the butcher blocks and stuff. So guys, I have here a nice, large, sweet onion. So all I'm going to do, we're going to be trimming the head off. Right, so this is the root end, right? This is what it grows out of, and this is the head, this is where it sprouts. So we're going to go ahead and slice that off so that we go ahead and we expose the inside, and then we take this bad boy and we cut him in half, keeping the root intentionally intact. Okay, so sensorial, you can do that, but also pay attention to the curvature of the knife. It's slightly bent this way too. And so the issue is, um, you know, you, you're doing that and then you're not getting like a full contact. The beauty of a bench scraper is that it's nice and flat. Hannah, I'm not really sure what you're asking me. Is that Doki Doki shoot? Yes, it is. I'm not entirely sure what you're asking, Hannah. Are you asking if you can be NSFW in the chat? No, because I try to keep this fairly, you know, PG-13. Unless it is important for us to otherwise. Okay, and so now guys, we're going to be keeping the root of the onion intact, and this is pretty important. And this is the easiest, and this is a fairly contemporary way of actually cutting up onions. Um, and so, we'll go into this in just a second, guys. So we are going to be doing the onion fan method, which is the root end of it is intact. So think of the onion as almost like flowering out and it's held together by this root end, right? This is where the fan is pinching all the different feathers. And so all that I'm going to do guys, first let's actually, yeah, let's just go ahead and make a bunch of parallel incisions. Again, we don't need these to be too small. We're looking, oh, graphics. Hannah, I would really, really prefer no advertisement in here. I am all set for now. I don't love people self-advertising in the chat. Okay, and so guys, we fan this out. We have this little onion fan. It's held together by the root, and this holds the onion as we go in and we get this lovely little dice. And now, this is a bit of an awkward shaped onion. These sort of like large sweet onions, they tend to be really, really flat. Vidalia onions, strawberry onions, that kind of thing, they tend to be really, really flat and a little clunky to chop with. And so, whenever your cutting board gets a little bit too crowded just like this, we go back in with the bench scraper, clean up the station, and into my transfer bowl it goes. Okay, and now let's go ahead and just cut this up again. Beautiful. It's okay, Hannah, thank you for apologizing. Thank you for understanding. Okay guys, and now we have this one half of the onion uh, just nicely cleaned up here. And so I'm thinking, do I actually want to use an entire onion for this today? Hmm, it's a good question. And the reason why I'm slightly hesitating is because we already have so many solids, we already have so many carrots, we have so many, uh, you know, butternut squash pieces that I don't actually want the onion to be really overpowering anything. I love onions, but the onions are not the star of today's show, and that was a fairly large chunk of onion as it is. Right, so we have all of these lovely aromatics, aka the celery and the onion now. Eh, you know what? Let's just do the onions. If it's too much onions, then it's too much onions. I personally do not think that we can have too much onions. So let's go ahead and do the rest of it. One large onion in total, guys. Once again, the onion fan making a bunch of lovely little incisions. And now we just go through 
and we cut this up into a nice small to medium dice. And again, you do not have to be perfect with the knife cuts because this entire soup is going to get all blended down. Uh, would it be like salsa if you use too much? Death Owl? Not particularly. I don't think so. It's going to get nice and sweet and nice and delicious. Okay. So all of my onions have been prepped. Everybody, I'm going to now start preheating a large pot slash saucepan. This is where the rest of the soup is actually going to be built. So medium heat. Let me show you this bad boy. One of my favorite, of course, pieces of equipment in the kitchen. This is my Mavier uh, saucepan. It's a very big saucepan. I don't know if you guys can tell. It's pretty huge. Um, and so we're going to be heating up a bunch of olive oil inside of this. We need the olive oil to properly coat the entirety of the vegetables. Also, School of Rock and Roll, thank you. That is what I'm going for. So we need a bunch of olive oil in here. You can't really have too much at this stage. Okay, we need that fat. That fat is going to make the whole thing creamy. And then it's also going to coat the vegetables as they fry. So, everybody, really quickly, we're heating this up on a medium heat. One of the biggest mistakes that you can make when you're heating up stainless steel is to use a high heat. You use a high heat, and then you risk getting hot spots and cool spots, even if you do the water test. So medium heat, medium heat is the key to make sure that your pan is nice and evenly heated. Medium heat over a long period of time instead of hot temperature for a short amount of time. Okay, so we're heating up a bunch of olive oil inside. Um, and the reason why I'm specifically using olive oil is because it's a delicious fat, right? I'm not using canola oil, I'm not using vegetable oil, I'm not using all these different oils that I feel like are just neutral tasting or even unpleasant tasting. Olive oil, because of the fact that this is an ingredient as much as every other component in the soup is, guys, the oil is an essential, essential component. So if you ignore it, if you sleep on it, what's going to end up happening is, well, you're going to just basically have an entire component that has not added anything to the quality of the soup itself. So that's why, Natalie. Thank you for asking. Also, hi, Natalie. It's lovely to have you. So we're heating up the oil, guys. We're going to get it nice and hot. And now, my friends, the goal is to actually properly saute the vegetables. One of the biggest issues, I want to make sure that you're all listening. I need to kill your chef right now from everybody watching, even if you're just tuning in. One of the biggest mistakes, one of the biggest problems in conventional recipe writing is when they say garbage, like, oh, saute your vegetables for two minutes. In two minutes time, you will accomplish absolutely nothing in your vegetable sauteing. The goal is to build color. Color equals flavor. We're browning the sugars. We're getting it nice and sweet and delicious. That process takes time. Why? The first thing that we need to do is to collapse the vegetables. Once they collapse, they release a bunch of liquid. Then we evaporate the liquid. They leave behind some of the sugars on the bottom. And then once the pan is dry enough, it's going to get a nice, beautiful color. You cannot rush this process. If your goal is to get these vegetables golden brown, this may take up to 10 minutes sometimes of pure sauteing. And we don't want a super high heat. The goal is not to brown it in the beginning. The beginning step is purely for, again, the collapsing of the vegetables. We first collapse the vegetables, we make them release the liquid, and I will walk you through this exact process. The key to this is medium heat and patience. Medium heat and patience. How do I feel about coconut oil? Would it be too conflicting of a flavor? Chunky yogurt, it would not be too conflicting. It depends on the context of the other things that you have going inside of this. If you're using coconut oil, that immediately makes me think of, you know, Indian cooking, specifically South Indian cooking. And then you can think of what other sort of like South uh, Indian flavors would you actually like in something like this. So I wouldn't consider it particularly conflicting at all. In fact, I consider today's dish fairly neutral. Only in considering your spices, you'd want to go ahead and do that. Um, okay, John Dahlia, the chef, the soup, the soup seems very sweet with the squash, carrots, and onion. Are you going to balance that with anything in particular? Yeah, well, it's gonna have the half and half, which I guess is just like kind of creamy and sweet. And then I'm also going to have some spices. Today, specifically, I have fennel seed, I have some nutmeg, um, and some coriander seeds as well, and some cumin. The cumin's gonna add a really nice earthiness, the coriander seed is gonna add a nice herbaceousness, the nutmeg tastes like nutmeg, and then the licorice. Uh, the licorice notes of the fennel seed are also going to be really, really pleasant in all of this. And so we're going to get a very nice balance of flavors this way. And so I think that will do kind of what you're looking for, John Dahlia. Uh, but this soup is intended to be sweet. That is a thing though. Um, so I have a concept that I really want to talk about quickly. Uh, but first, I want to just go ahead and check. Oh no, guys, 
Did I slightly burn my butternut squash? I think I might have ended up burning my squash. I think this got a little too much color too quickly. I started smelling it and I'm like, wait a second, what's going on here? Let me turn down my oil temperature really quickly. How much color did we actually, a little bit much. Yeah, that's a little too roasted for me. And that's okay. Um, we're just going to give it a little flip. It looks like my oven wasn't completely evenly uh, heated in temperature. I could have probably babysat this a little bit more. So we're pulling this out a few minutes earlier. And all I'm doing guys is I'm going in one by one and I'm flipping each of my little butternut squashes. So why did this happen? Uh, good question. It just kind of depends on your squash during the day right, on which day of the week. This side of the pan seems to be a little bit drier. In fact, I'm thinking of just discarding these squashes altogether. They're a little bit charred, and that's okay. That happens to the best of us. Yeah, my pan was not like evenly heated at all. Like the front of the oven was a lot hotter. So I'm just going to go ahead and give everything a quick little flip, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw it back on in. So I apologize for the quick little interruption. It happens, guys, it happens to the best of us. So why did this happen? I've done this a million times before, and I've not had anything quite like this happen. I should have probably spread this out a little bit better in the oven. That's okay. All right, is there anything here I'm neglecting? Ooh, yeah, that we don't, we don't even think about these guys. These guys are, are done skis for me. They are done. They have nothing else to say. They have nothing else to add to this conversation. These guys are out of here. Goodbye. Hi, Barbara. Lovely to have you. It's been a little bit. Hope you're doing well today. Yeah, so we're going to have to waste a couple of them. That's okay, guys. They're just a little too dark. They're a little too burnt for me. Uh, there is no way to salvage it other than, you know, to physically go in there and then try to take off um, some of the burnt stuff, which is more effort than it is worth for me personally. And so I gave these guys a nice little flip. I should have agitated them sooner, probably is my uh, thought here. I should have at least just given them a little poke around just to make sure they're doing okay. So that's on me. That's my fault, guys. I do apologize for the bad technique here. A little bit atypical for me to ever make a mistake, but that's okay. And these guys on the bottom seem to be not doing all that much better, actually. Oof. Yeah, guys, these are... I'm gonna say it as it is. I kind of fucked up. These guys are... These guys are toasted. These guys are... Uh... These guys are, are scorched on the bottom. Oh no. What do I do? That's a good question. Well, I'm going to go through these and see which ones are actually genuinely salvageable. This is a lot more roasted than I would have liked for my butternut squash a little bit. I don't know if you guys can tell, but they're a little, uh, they're a little rough. They're definitely a little rough around the edges. That is bizarre though, at 425, it should not have gone that dark. There's just no way for it to get that dark that quickly. I've done this multiple times in the past and I've never had such an issue. I've, I mean, this entire sheet tray, guys, this one is, is, is a little bit brutal. Whoa, okay. Well, there's a couple of pieces in here that are kind of okay. So we, we're gonna flip it. We're gonna put it back in. We're gonna get the other side roasted and then we'll just like let it cool off and then maybe we'll just clean them up a little bit. How's that sound? That sound okay to y'all? Some of them we may just have to end up tossing. We might just have to be okay with that. I'm a little disappointed guys. I'm a little upset about this. I can't lie. Yeah, at 425, usually butternut squashes, they take a little bit of time before they get to this point. So this is fairly atypical for me. Okay, all right, so that is heavily, heavily charred. I'm not the happiest about that at the moment. Ah, oh, that is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly disappointing. Oh well. Well, guys, we will figure something out. We squelched them, we're going to go ahead and fix them. They look like you had the boiling on, I agree. Yeah, these guys are heavily, heavily, heavily roasted. Generously so. And so we'll, 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 we'll salvage them. So I think all that I'm going to do actually is uh, we're just going to go through them one by one and then we're just going to trim off the parts that seem a little bit burnt. How's that sound? Does that sound good to all of you? I ended up turning off the heat on this, by the way, while we did that. Oof, a little brutal, a little guff. We're getting ourselves nice and composed. Is everybody still watching? I wanna hear a nice yes, chef, please and thank you. Oh. 
We'll salvage it. We'll make it happen. I'm not gonna waste anything today. Okay, let's get this bad boy back onto the heat. It's gonna flick through my camera probably. Okay, my oil at this point should actually be nice and hot. And again, even if it's not, the goal at this stage is just to collapse the vegetables every so slightly. Nice medium heat, everybody. Medium to low heat only when you're doing a stainless steel pan and heating it up for a long amount of time. I just kept it off the flame so that it wouldn't accidentally overheat. My oil is slightly shimmering, I believe. And so now would be a really good time to add in all of my lovely onions and all of my lovely celery. So let's get this bad boy back into the oven. Ooh, back into the pan, excuse me. And let's get all of it nicely covered with all that oil. And this is going to take some time, everybody. This is going to take some time. We got, we're going to need to collapse the vegetables. We need to extract the liquid. This process of sauteing, you cannot rush. You cannot rush this step. Okay. So I am going to now go ahead and season this quite generously with some salt just to go ahead and get my vegetables seasoned. And all of this, guys, it's going to collapse. It's going to lose a significant amount of volume. So even though this pan looks fairly full, I promise you it's going to shrink down. It's going to cook down. All of that stuff is still just going to happen. So let's just mix in all of that salt, guys. And now we just have to go ahead and let that do its thing. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me in the meantime? I'm a little disappointed about my butter not squash at the moment. I've never actually burnt something like that on the stream, I think. I don't make a lot of mistakes when I cook. I think I was just like a little absent-minded today. And so I think now I'm going to be just babying him a little bit more than I usually would. At least one of the trays seemed to have come out okay. And in fact, all that I'm going to do, I think I'm not even going to mess with this other tray, the one that like got really, really squelched. I'm just going to let that cool off and let it cool off enough until we can actually process it and break it down the way that we need to. And so the other tray, that is the one I'm more confident uh, in actually allowing to continue to roast. This bad boy, I'm just going to go ahead and cool down. Okay, everything's okay, everything is salvaged. Lovely. Yeah, this is a part of cooking, guys. A part of cooking is about troubleshooting and salvaging and knowing exactly what went wrong. And so for today specifically, my heat was a little bit too high and I should have just been checking on them a little bit more. Um, carrots do hold up well to being fairly roasted. I just don't know if you can see these. They're just kind of not roasted. They're blackened. They are completely blackened on the one side. And so I want to give them a little taste. I am curious how much of that bitterness actually does translate over. I'm glad that you find this reassuring. You wouldn't want like a, you know, like a fireman to accidentally burn something. That would be the opposite of reassuring. But in my case, I'm special. I'm different. And so let me just go ahead and just like cut into this. So you guys can see that is a fairly, you know, charred vegetable here. Oop. That is hot and right out of the oven. Mm. You know, it doesn't taste scorched at all. Oh, I take it back. It definitely does. That's okay. We'll just trim it up a little bit. We're definitely getting some of that bitterness from it. That's totally okay. We'll let it cool. We'll let it do its thing. And then we'll just go in there and we'll trim them up one by one. Then we'll get it back into the soup. How's that sound? I think that's a viable strategy for today, guys. And so I want you all to go ahead and take a look at the pan again. Uh, Abdu, that's a little bit of a strange statement. I don't know why you chose to say that. I want you to listen, though. I need a yes chef from you. Okay? So... Everybody, look at this. I want you all to look into the pan. Do you see how wet it's become? Do you see how wet that pan is? Do you hear the sound changing? That's all of the water being released from the onions and from the celery. This process of sauteing cannot happen over the course of just two minutes. This has to happen over the course of five to 10 to 15 minutes because in three minutes, all of the liquid is gonna get released from the vegetables and you would have developed absolutely no color. You have to be patient. Abdu, I'd rather you focus on the food at the moment, okay? So we're letting these vegetables cool down. We're going to give them a second and then we'll go ahead and process them and then we'll go back into them. But I'm also 21 years old, okay? We're just going to let that cook, guys. We're going to let all that water evaporate. So how do you know if there's water in the pan versus oil? We know if it's water, if the uh, liquid on the bottom looks cloudy. The cloudiness means that there is sort of water bubbles suspended in all the oil on the bottom. And then you'll also hear a change in the sound. If it's cooking in oil, you hear a higher end sound. 
If it's cooking in water or it's steaming or it's bubbling, you hear a lower and psh sound. When we hear this lower and psh sound, we know that there is no risk of this actually burning. At the moment, it's not that high end uh, sizzle yet, right? It's a difference between a sizzling sound and a boiling sound. And so it's just going to take a little bit of time. And so what I also want to do is I do want to go ahead and get rid of my other sheet tray. Um, and just sort of have that cooling off as well. I'm just going to set this one up right here. I just want my sheet trays to get nice and cool, guys, uh, so that we can do the vegetable processing for them. Because they got a little too roasted, unfortunately. So it happens. We'll clean them up. We'll make a really, really delicious soup nonetheless. Can I please get a yes, chef? Please and thank you from everybody watching. Okay. Yeah, no, these bad boys... Oh, I probably could have done like 300 degrees or something. I don't know why they got so dark so quickly today. I've never seen that happen in all the times that I've made this. Yeah, chef, perfect. I like how responsive everybody is being today. And so let's go ahead and get this other sheet tray out and we'll get him cooling down and ready to go for this as well. And so guys, this sheet tray is looking a lot better for sure. This sheet tray, we're babying a little bit more, right? We're being a little bit more attentive to it. In fact, we could probably just continue to ghost this one as normal because we don't have any that we need to actually trim through this. So I'm just going to flip these over. Like that one's a little bit dark, but these are actually all looking super good at the moment. Okay, some of them better than others. Interesting. Some of them significantly better than others. Let's just take that one and flip it around a little bit. Get this one moved over to the center. Get this one flipped over. Get some of these flipped over. There you go. It's all gonna be okay, guys. You normally have butter on 350, but on 350 it would take so long, John Dahlia, to get any amount of color. And again, the goal isn't to get them like fully cooked through anything. The goal was purely for the color. And color we did get, perhaps just a lot faster than I was initially anticipating okay and I think that does look pretty good actually so I'm going to give these bad boys a little flip just like this and let's just go ahead and throw them back into my oven for like another uh, like six minutes or so and then call it a day with them yeah we definitely did get color John we definitely got color this time that is not a, that, uh, us not getting color is not a concern in the slightest. Okay. And that goes back into the oven and I'm setting a timer for about five minutes. One, two, three, four, five. Lovely. Let's give the vegetables a nice little stir just to make sure they're nicely and evenly cooking. Guys, again, they're taking time to collapse and that means we have a little bit of extra prep time to get some more stuff done. Does anybody have any questions for me in the meantime? Okay. So the next step, guys, we're going to need plenty of fresh garlic because you can't have a butternut squash soup or any kind of soup for the matter without a bunch of garlic. So let's go ahead and get some prep now. You just cannot. So I have a nice big old garlic head here. I like to initially first pluck off the cloves over like my little trash bowl like this. Okay, ah, there you go. And I want a bunch of garlic. I want plenty of garlic. So this amount of garlic, this quantity right here, I think that's what I'm gonna be going for today. That's the quantity that I want. So let's now go ahead and break them up even further. One, these are like four big garlic cloves. Dalian garlic is never happening, Tarina. It's never, never happening, I'm sorry to say. Okay, there you go. Again, you really can't have too much of this stuff, guys. I want a nice, delicious, flavorful, rich soup today, okay? And we need all of that garlic, all of that aroma, all of that pungency. Enough to kill an Italian, because let me tell you, mainland Italians, they cannot stand the way that American Italians use all that garlic. And so, my friends, all that we need to do to peel it, so g spent Gaming, you saying it's annoying to peel it? All that we have to do is just give it a little smash. All we have to do is just give it a little tap. Also, hello, Taza. Welcome on in. Give each of these bad boys a little tap. Give each of them a little smashing. All the way through. There you go. And there you go. Lovely. And now that we've done that, guys, we can go ahead and easily just get the cloves separated from the skins. Just like that. 
You only use a couple cloves for your favorite soup dishes. I am a garlic maximalist. I am garlic maxing at all possible times. And guys, again, the vegetables. The reason that we're able to step away is because they're currently in the boiling phase. Because of the fact that my carrots, or excuse me, my celery and my onions have released water, there is no risk of us burning them at the stage. But these need time. They need some time and they need some love and they need some uh, patience, okay, to get them to actually where we want them to be. So we smashed every single one of them. And now we were just able to easily, easily pluck off all of my skins. There you go all of my de-skinned garlic. Ready to go, my friends. And as always, I cannot stand for the life of me chopping garlic. I consider it an incredible headache. So all that I'm going to do is I'm going to just trim off the bottoms of each of my garlic cloves, right? Like the dried off root ends, because we have no use for that. Okay. All of that is now gone. All of that has now been officially dealt with. Okay, and then I'm also going to go ahead and check on my vegetables in the oven because I'm no longer taking any chances on them. We're not playing any games with them anymore. We burnt that first batch. This batch is gonna be perfect, I promise you. Yeah, this batch, that's looking a little bit more like of what I wanted to. Um, I don't think it's as fully roasted on the bottom as I would have liked at this stage, but you know what, it's fine. We're not gonna push this one any further. Let's just go ahead and clear off the oven and we'll let this batch cool down. That one is all ready to go, my friends. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and keep on going with all the garlic. Is garlic good for high blood pressure? I have not even a little clue. I have no idea. So my friends, a garlic uh, press is something that everybody must have in a home kitchen. I firmly believe that chopping garlic is a messy, sticky, unpleasant, uncomfortable endeavor. I don't actually think I properly cleaned mine because that's all the stuff from last time. There you go. So in goes each of my clubs, my friends. Every single last one of them. Beautiful. Darla, please give us medical advice. Of course. Yeah, that's what the stream is for. That's what I'm very qualified to do. Okay, guys. Every single last one of these things. In all of it goes. Beautiful. And let's do the last one. Yes, doctor. Chef doctor. Doctor chef. I think doctor chef is better. Mmm. What do you guys think about Dr. Chef? That would go pretty hard. Okay, and now guys, let's go ahead and just get a little paling knife. Beautiful. That's it, that's all that it takes. And now we have all of my garlic nice and processed and ready to go. And all I'm going to do guys, is I'm going to rinse out my garlic press and poke it with a little teeny tiny brush. Just to make sure that all the little garlic pieces are out of it, that nothing is stuck inside. There we go. And that timer is telling us that it's time to take the vegetables out of the oven, but they are already out and chilling and hanging out. So there's nothing else that we need to do with them. Darla, but I wear a chef coat if I had one. Uh, maybe, I think that would be cute. What if I just started dressing up in a... Uh, I thought about getting like a really nice like leather apron or something, something tacky like that. I thought that would be pretty cute. Okay, guys, this vegetable cooking process, it takes some serious time. And now you can hear that sound change. You can hear it now finally properly become a sizzle. And once we've actually hit the point that it's sizzling, this is where your vegetables can burn if we walk away from it too much. This is why we need it to be nice and patient. Why we need it to go nice and low and slow with this, my friends. This is a process that takes time. You cannot rush the process of sauteing all of your vegetables. So we're just scraping it down, we're making sure there's nothing stuck to the sides, and we're continuing to cook this on a low, medium heat at most. Also, hi, Ben Zhukov. It's lovely to have you. Okie dokie. So I'm just taking a second, I'm cleaning up my mess of a station right now, admittedly. My goodness. I have a bunch of towels laying around. Ugh, ridiculous. Okay, and what is happening behind me? Oh, this is equipment I'm gonna use later on, isn't it? Okay. Just taking a look, guys. Okay, so the vegetables are going. The butternut squash is finished roasting. Uh, we did the garlic. And now the next step for the soup that we actually have to do today, guys, is we need to go ahead and process the spices because I want to fry and toast the spices. So, because we'll be slightly stepping away from the onions and the celery, I'm just going to be slightly turning down the heat, guys. Let's go ahead and make a really, really lovely uh, fresh spice mixture that we'll be adding on inside. Is everybody ready? I want to hear Yes Chef right now, please and thank you. And of course, if you have any cooking questions whatsoever, I'm here to help you learn how to cook. Okay. 
There you go. That's all done. That's all taken care of. Lovely. Was there something on my arm? Yes, there was. Okay, so let's go ahead and get the spices done for you today, everybody. Let's go back on over to my cutting board. And now we're going to be setting up one of my favorite tools to have, guys, a little teeny tiny mortar and pestle. And so this is the spice blend that I'm going to be using for you today. These are just some dried spices that got caked on. I never do anything wet inside of my mortar and pestle, guys. I keep it entirely dry so that all I have to do at the end of cooking is just give it a little wipe off. Okay, so it's just spices. There's no garlic in here. There's no nothing. I keep it really, really clean. I keep it really, really simple. And so here's a spice blend that we're going to be using for you today. I'm going to want a little bit, not too much, a little bit of fennel seed. Fennel seed for that licorice note that it provides. It's really, really delicious, but too much fennel seed, and then it becomes overpoweringly fennel -y. That That is one that you definitely want to be super, super careful with. The next spice, guys, that we're going to be adding, that we can be a little bit more uh, generous with, is going to be some fresh coriander seeds. So I'm going to do two little handfuls just like that. Fresh coriander seeds. And now my favorite spice, my favorite spice that I love in every single cuisine that it is possibly used in, guys. I cannot go wrong. You cannot go wrong with some cumin seeds. So I am going to try and get this container open somehow. A bunch of these whole cumin seeds. Guys, Whole spices, so much more flavor than their pre-ground counterparts. When spices are pre-ground, they lose so much flavor as they sit there and they're exposed to both oxygen and to light. When they're in their whole format and you're grinding them to order, you're getting a much more intense, a much more flavorful, a much more delicious spice. So I'm going to go ahead and just stir my vegetables again. Make sure nothing is scorching on the bottom because I've never done that in my entire life of cooking whatsoever. Okay, just stirring everything around really, really nicely. My vegetables are looking delicious at the moment, guys. Um, where did I get my mortar and pestle from? I think I got this one from Ikea a very long time ago. What are my thoughts on dill in a soup like this? Ozzy, dill would be an amazing garnish. You can use any kind of fresh herb that you would love for something like this. And so again, I'm using the cumin for the earthy notes, the coriander for the herbaceousness, and that little bit of fennel seed for just that like little licorice kick. Okay, so all I'm doing, guys, is once I've actually crushed up the seeds, Right, I'm crushing it, I'm grinding it, I'm crushing, I'm grinding it, and now I'm just going around with my mortar and pestle, and we're getting a nice, beautiful spice powder. And this is going to be the seasoning, this is going to be an incredible, incredible flavoring of today's soup. And we wanna get all these chunks, all of them gone, all of them processed, every single last one if possible. Can I please get a chef? Please and thank you. Okay. And again, we're just babysitting these vegetables. We're not letting them go off too much on their own. If we let them go off too much on their own, we do risk burning them. Instead, we just want beautiful, delicious, soft, sauteed vegetables. Okay. And then the next step is going to be actually salvaging all of my butternut squash. So we're going through all of this, guys. We're going through all of it. We're going through all of it. We're getting it done. We're getting all of these spices beautifully and deliciously ground up. You can smell the flavor. And then the key is going to be actually frying these spices and infusing them into the olive oil. Okay. So getting it done. Almost there. We still have a couple of chunks. We still have a couple of fibers on the bottom. Just give it a little shake if need be. And we'll just go back in. Go back in, get all of it ground up, and it smells pretty incredible. It smells fairly excellent at the moment. Okay, and getting all of it done, just spin, 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 spin. Also, for those of you that haven't already done so, I do highly recommend checking out my Patreon. You can type in exclamation mark Patreon, you can scroll down and go into the About section if you would like to support the cooking show, because I would love to be able to do this full time at one point. Okay, almost done with the grinding, everybody. Almost done, a little bit more to go, okay? Just get it every single little tiny last fiber, although if you miss a couple, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Okay, and now I'm just going to go ahead and transfer this to one of my favorite kitchen tools, a little teeny tiny condiment cup, guys. If you do not own a condiment cup, you are absolutely missing out. These are one of my favorite ways to get organized inside of a kitchen. I think everybody should own at least a couple of these. So, here's the order of operations, everybody. 
The first step is to finish the sauteing of the vegetables. Let's go ahead and take a look and see how that's going. We're getting the oil infused with all the aroma of the onions and the celery. We don't add the garlic in until later because the garlic has the highest chance of burning. If we added the garlic in sooner, we would have burnt the garlic before we actually got the sauteing stage done. We're going to then fry the spices. We're not just boiling the spices. We're not just adding them in the end. We're frying them initially in the oil so that we can infuse the spices and then we can also toast them simultaneously. We want to infuse those spices into the oil properly. Then I'm going to be deglazing it all with a splash of white wine and the white wine I just want for some additional flavor. And then we'll be letting the whole thing cook down and we'll be getting all of it really, really nice and soft. So I'm just going to dump out my waste bowl in the meantime. I'm going to continue to get my station nice and clean and nice and organized for us. Lovely. And so once that happens, uh, once we get the wine reduced, we'll add in some water. Um, you can do some vegetable stock, you can do chicken stock for this, you can also just use some plain water. We're going to let all the vegetables cook, to the, uh, cook together. We're going to get it all really nice and soft to the point that it's all falling apart. And then we'll blend it in with the half and half. So we still have quite a bit to go. And also, really good question to me. Uh, I use the Rode Wireless Go 2. That's the microphone that I use. Uh, it's a very nice love and very easy to use. Okay. So guys, again, we're continuing to properly saute these vegetables. Do you see how much time this takes? Do you see how much effort it takes to properly and fully saute a vegetable? That is why this is not a process that you can rush. This is not the kind of a thing that you can get done in five minutes. When you see a recipe that says, saute your onions for five minutes, it's absolute nonsense. We're not looking for like a fully deep, like super like golden caramelized onion or anything, but we're just looking for some amount of color. And this is the amount of time and effort that we need. Again, we're going on a medium heat here so that everything can cook evenly and slowly and we're stirring it often, but not so often that we're just cooling off the pan, everybody. So all of that is going, all that is ready to go. Soon enough, we'll add in the spices, we'll add in the garlic. I'm also gonna get my white wine ready to go. And again, the wine here isn't particularly essential. I just think it'll be a nice flavor. So John Dolly was talking about like balancing out the sweetness. Uh, and I think the wine would be really nice. Uh, hi, Herbie. I would really appreciate not being called babe though. What is a medium heat? So Taza, whenever I say medium heat, I do typically refer to the four through six range. Uh, a medium heat is not so high that your oil starts smoking, but it's not so cold that things aren't sizzling in a pan. Uh, in order to maintain a medium heat, does the stove's heat have to be adjusted or lowered over time? So this depends if you're cooking on induction, uh, induction, gas, or electric. The issue is electric stoves are kind of on or off at all times, so they overheat and underheat. Um, and so with gas, it's like you have a lot more control and I'm able to keep it at a medium heat. Uh, if you're cooking with live fire, that's also a really big question. With electric stoves, it's really complicated. I don't know how to give good advice for an electric stove. For an induction stove, you're typically keeping it the same. With gas stoves, you're typically keeping it the same. Um, but if you ever notice your pan getting too hot and things are like smoking, you can always turn it down. So let's go in there and give this whole thing a nice little stir, my friends. Once again, now everything is getting nice and aromatic. Everything is getting nice and beautifully golden brown. But yeah, no, electric stoves are a tragedy to work with. And so guys, the next step is going to be actually properly saving all of my butternut squash. Remember, the ones that we roasted a little bit too much, we're going to fix it. I will fix her. I can fix her. You can fix her, everybody. Hope this helps. Um, and so we just have to trim off all the ends that got a little bit too charred from it because otherwise our soup is just going to end up being bitter. And so instead of, you know, tossing this out or being too wasteful with it, I want to do the difficult thing. I want to do the strenuous step. I want to do the laborious step. Okay, so let's go ahead and just get this done now. So really quickly, I'm just going to get my vegetables onto this bowl and let's get this all processed. This is going to take a while. This is going to be an incredibly annoying process. We have a bunch of little pieces that we need to fix, but we'll make it happen, everybody. We can and we will make it happen. Isn't that right? Can I please get a yes chef? I need to make sure that all of you believe in me. Yeah, chef, perfect. It's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some effort, but I am determined not to waste those vegetables, guys. We got them a little bit too charred, we got them a little too smoky, we got them a little bit too bitter, and that is okay. This is how we salvage it. Is it a little bit wasteful? Yes, but 
it's better than throwing out the whole thing instead. So each of these guys, one by one guys, all I'm going to do is I'm going to individually with a little paring knife, just shave off the side that has been overly charred. Just like this, so you see how charred that got? You see how blackened that got? Every single one of these, we're going to clean them up. This is going to be laborious. This is gonna be repetitive, but this is what happens when you accidentally chug the hell out of your vegetables. And so, it's fine if there's like a little bit of it on, but if we kept all of this, our soup would just be incomprehensibly, undeliciously bitter. It would just not be a pleasant eating experience for anybody involved. And thus, I will do what I must. We will do what we have to do. Sometimes we'll lose a bunch of the vegetable, and that's okay, because at least we are saving and keeping some of it. Oh, my poor carrots, my poor butternut squash. Guys, I don't really typically burn things, but what I do want to show you is that, you know, in a way, this is a little serendipity. This is, in its way, a little happy little accident, right? Because we messed up, and I'm showing you how to fix it once you've messed something up. Not everything in cooking has to be completely restarted and thrown away. And so, is the soup going to be perfect in exactly the way that I intended it? No, but we're still going to salvage it. Everything is salvageable. That one is looking okay. Let's just go ahead and get rid of this guy. Everything can, well, not everything is salvageable. Sometimes you do have to restart. This is not one of those things that you have to restart. If you want to put in the time, if you want to put in the effort, we can fix it. Isn't that right? I need another yes, chef. And this would also be a really good time for questions. Yes, thank you for the reminder. If anybody has any and all cooking questions, this would be a really good time to ask. Guys, we're, we're going through this batch. We're getting done with almost half of it at this point. We're getting all of it done. Yeah, that one is just incomprehensibly burnt. That one is just gone. Ooh, some of these are brutal. Like, these guys, I'm losing a good chunk of mass here. So I'm not very proud of this. This is not my proudest moment, but I am happy that I do get to show off how to at least fix this if this does happen to you. Oh, guys, these vegetables, the sautéed vegetables, these bad boys, they look amazing at the moment, I have to say. They look wonderful. They're getting nice and golden. You can see how much they've cooked down. They're getting nice and aromatic. Is there a vegetable or ingredient that you find overrated? Um, as far as overrated ingredients go, I think steaks are one of them. Uh, because steaks are incredibly expensive and not very, like, typically affordable for most people. And then the steaks that are affordable, like, let's say, like, a choice not like or like a select cut something, they're not typically very delicious. So I think that steaks are incredibly overrated. Uh, aside from steaks though, is there any vegetable or ingredient that I find overrated? So yeah, fancy pants, please hit me. Um, I'm trying to think for a second. What do I find overrated in a kitchen? I guess truffle oil kind of came and went. Right? And so truffles aren't particularly overrated. They're just expensive because of how much they cost. Right? Um, it, 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 the, that was a stupid statement. I just said they're expensive because of how much they cost. They're expensive because of how uh, difficult they are to actually, like, you know, produce and to secure. Right? Especially because of the fact that they get imported into the United States. That's why truffles are so expensive. And similar thing with, like, caviar, right? It's, like, very, like, small farm productions that are typically uh, outputting it. And so that's kind of why it's expensive. And I think it's not overrated by the people that are selling it. It's overrated by the people that have then, you know, generated some hype around it. And so I wouldn't actually call that a true overrated ingredient. It's overrated by the layman that has no idea what they're talking about. That's my, that's my answer. The layman that has no idea what they're talking about, they'll think that, oh, truffles are, and, and caviar, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, have I ever cooked with saffron? I have. I have. I made like, um, you know, like a risotto milanese once, right? Like with the, with the saffron. Oof. My friends, we have a lot of this butternut squash to go through. We're almost there though. Pickled red onions got overused here for a long while. You know what? John Dahlia, you're so right. I was recently thinking about this. I was thinking about how sick I was of making pickled red onions. I was showing off how many different, like how cool it is. I think I want to find some additional uses. Uh, for red onions that's not just pickled ones. So John, that is such a based, based answer. I love that answer that you just gave us. Guys, we're doing it. We're cleaning up, we are fixing all of this butternut squash, all of this charred stuff that would have just otherwise made it bitter. We're taking the time, we're being patient, right? This was not expected. I wasn't expecting to do this, but it's okay. Um, I mean, caviar tastes like caviar, Benjukov. It's not like an ingredient can't be bad. 
An ingredient is only bad relative to its own expectations. And so, with caviar, I think it tastes good, especially in certain contexts, but that's all that it'll ever taste. It'll taste like caviar. And it's only so special because of the allure and the mystique of eating something so expensive. So I wouldn't say that it's not like too good or anything. I think that's like a little bit harsh, you know? Oh guys, we're getting it done. Mm. You know, in spite of the fact that it is charred, it is still very delicious. Mm. Yeah, just some of it is a little bit intense and that's okay. We'll fix it guys, we'll clean it up, we'll get all of it done. We're almost done. What about fake meats like Beyond Meat? Um, so, Serena, it's a little bit more of a complex question. Would you consider these charred bits completely unusable now after cutting them off? Yes, I would, Taza, because, uh, because this is a charred butternut squash and a charred carrot, because they're both really sweet, uh, this charred stuff tends to be really bitter. On something like, let's say, a Brussels sprout, you know, they're really, really delicious because the natural like lack of sugar, uh, it doesn't actually taste all that bitter. But because of how bitter these are, I would basically say that these are fairly unusable now. Yeah. And so with fake meats, as in like, are we talking about like beyond meat? Taza, I know that they look good to you. I know that they look good. For the rest of us though, it would taste a little bit too bitter. But in regards to like my opinion for like Beyond Meat, my issue there is purely an accessibility standpoint. And the reality is that the only people that things like Beyond Meat really like, the target demographic is tech workers that make a six figure salary because those are the only kinds of people that can actually afford to consistently get it. And so my issue is, is that the philosophy is, com is incomplete and it's purely done for profit, right? They have a target demographic that's going to generate the, the most mm, amount of revenue. Right? And thus, and this is, this is like a constant trend, this is a constant problem with vegan food, that the people that are developing all these different meat substitutes, they're not actually taking into account the whole picture whatsoever. They're not taking into account the whole picture and it's done very selfishly. And also, I say the same exact thing, by the way, about farm-to-table restaurants. I cannot stand most farm-to-table restaurants because they might have this incredible ecological mission, but the only people they're servicing are those with enough money to go eat there. It's complete, it's incomplete, and it's selfish, and it's short-sighted. It's saying, yeah, you know, we don't really care about poor people because, you know, they can't afford to do it, but for the rich people, you can feel better about yourselves. Ugh, I find it so annoying. My friends, we've done it. We have fixed her. We've officially fixed her. We have fixed all of my butternut squash, okay? And now I'm just going to go ahead and scoop all of it up and put it back into the bowl. We fixed her. I'm really, really happy about this, that we don't have to waste any of this. We just cleaned all of it up. We still got like those delicious roasted flavors, just not as perfect as I would have liked. I wanted like those really nice crispy bits, but that's okay. And now, my friends, we can go back on over to the rest of the soup. My vegetables have been patiently sautéing this whole time. Do you see the flavor in this? Do you see how beautiful and golden it is, my friends? That is the product that we get from sautéing this low and slow. Can I please get a yes, chef? Do not rush sautéing your vegetables. They've built up so much beautiful flavor now as a result. And so, my friends, we're going to add in my next two components. And now this has to move fast. We add in the garlic and then we add in all of my lovely spices. And now we want this to fry, but this is the stuff that can easily burn. So medium heat, we're breaking up the cluster of garlic, we're breaking up the spices, and we're making sure to just keep on going and keep on moving. We're keeping the white wine handy because this process is only going to take about 30 seconds to a minute or so. We're getting the garlic nicely and beautifully fried. We're infusing that olive oil with all of the spices, with all of this incredible flavor, my friends getting all of it done, every single last bit of it. Okay? I know it doesn't look like much, but my friends, this is going to be the base. This is going to transform into a beautiful, delicious, rich butternut squash soup for us today. So we're frying the garlic, we're constantly moving it just to make sure it doesn't squirch, especially the spices, because that also is at high risk for squirching. So we're moving it around, it's got plenty of fat to infuse into. 
okay? And now that that has now been lovely and beautifully fried, we are going to add in a generous glug of white wine. This was a last minute decision inspired by John. Thank you, John, for the recommendation. The wine is going to help deglaze the pan. We're going to get all of those little bits that are stuck to the bottom, dissolved back into the wine, and then we're going to add in the rest of my vegetables and of course a bunch of water to get it going. So let's get all of this stirred and guys, scrape it up. Scrape up this pan. Get it going, get it boiling. This is going to be the base of so much incredible flavor for today's butternut squash soup. I need another Yes Chef right now. Please and thank you. Okay, that's going, that looks wonderful. That looks gorgeous. Let's move it all around. Let's scrape all of it up, get everything, every last bit unstuck from the bottom, unstuck from the sides. Let's get this up to a nice aggressive boil. Lovely. And I am going to just get my bowl full of butternut squash and get that ready for whenever it is time to add it all into the pot. So celery and onions sauteed in a bunch of olive oil. We added garlic, we added in some freshly ground fennel seed, some coriander seed, some cumin seed as well. The nutmeg will add in a little bit at the end. Very like classical French thing to do to pair like nutmeg with dairy, which is gonna be the half and half later on. So I'm getting all of the squash just ready to go for us because we're soon going to need all of it. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me at the moment? Again, this didn't go perfectly according to plan, but we're making it work and we're salvaging everything that we need to. Lovely. That's all of my squash now, roasted and beautiful and as always, ready to go. I am going to just take a second to quickly clean up my station, get rid of a couple of things, just toss some things into the garbage. Because remember my friends, you have to clean as you cook. You wanna make sure that your dishwasher is nice and empty before you begin. If you don't have an empty dishwasher, you're going to have a full sink. If you have a full sink already, you're going to have it completely piling up over the top. You really, really want to ensure that when you're cooking at home, that you're keeping everything nice and organized. That is the key to being a good home cook, my friends. It is managing your active time. It is managing your passive time. You manage your time, and I promise you, you will have plenty of time in between things to actually properly clean up. So we did it, we saved the squash, which I am exceptionally, I don't think I used the word exceptionally correctly, but I'm really, really happy about it. Okay, and let's stir everything around. Again, we're just getting any and all bits that could be possibly stuck at the moment, unstuck. This is going to be the base of so much lovely flavor in my soup today, guys. And this is the kind of a soup that reheats incredibly well. This is the kind of a soup that lasts in the fridge. This is what I'm looking to bring to work tomorrow, right? So that I can have it as my lunch. That is the goal that I'm trying to fulfill here. That is the function of all of this. Okay. Uh, chef, which dishes in my opinion are overrated or underrated? Uh, Jack, you know what? A better question. You give me a dish that you think is either overrated or underrated, and then I give you my opinion on it, because I think your question is too general. And so guys, we don't have to completely reduce all the white wine at the moment. We're just doing this to mostly make ourselves feel better, right? The, the alcohol is still going to evaporate anyways at the end of the day. And so I'm just going to go in with all of my lovely roasted butternut squash that we salvaged, we fixed her. Let's add that into the pot now. And now we're going to need to flood the whole thing with some water. I don't have any vegetable stock. I don't have any chicken stock. But what I do have is I have some powdered chicken bouillon. And that's what we're going to be adding into this. I love my powdered chicken bouillon. I love its usage in so much Mexican cooking, so much Latin American cooking. And so guys, all I'm really looking to do now is just to get all of my vegetables nicely covered with some plain old water. We'll be able to add in and substitute more water as we need it. And we don't need any more additional salt at the moment because again, I'll be going in with my chicken bouillon. So chicken bouillon out. Where did she go? Did I already take it out? I don't think so. So where is it? There she is. So powdered chicken bouillon. And now I do wanna also clarify something. If you don't have powdered chicken bouillon, if you don't have better than bouillon, and you don't have homemade stock, just use water. The thing that I want all of you to take note of right now, I need to make sure that all of you are listening. You know what to say. I hate boxed chicken stock with a passion. Let me say it again. I cannot stand boxed chicken stock for the life of me. I think boxed chicken stock is one of the most evil things sold to people. You're buying a carton of completely diluted, flavorless liquid that barely tastes like a homemade chicken stock or even this stuff, mind you. 
for the price that is way higher than you need. You're buying a bunch of additional water weight. I think that box chicken stock is a tragedy. I would rather cook with water out of sheer principle. And if you're not cooking with water, I would do better than bouillon or I would do something like this. Box chicken stock is an absolutely unnecessary convenience. It sucks as a product and it is way too expensive for what it is. I need a yes chef from everybody right now. That is the thing that I want all of you to take away. I'm not telling everybody that you have to make your own homemade stocks. I make homemade stock and I try to show you how to do it and make it nice and fun. You don't need to be doing that. But what you do not need to be doing is buying boxed chicken stock. You can use powdered chicken bouillon. You can use stock pots. You can do better than bouillon. You can do whatever you want. But boxed chicken stock, that is a tragedy. And look at my beautiful soup, my friends. Look at my beautiful soup. Now all of Mr. Squash is inside with all of my lovely vegetables. And now this bad boy is all going to stew together. I'm going to put away a couple of my spices. So please forgive me for the moment because again, we are cleaning as we go. And so I just wanna ensure that I have nothing laying around where it does not need to be. And that's all done and that's all put away. And my friends, I believe we can move on to the next component uh, in just a second. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me? Um, so Jack, avocado toast. Avocado toast, I wouldn't say became overrated. It became a bit of a meme because avocado toast, uh, to complain about avocado toast, I feel like a 40 year old. I feel like a 40 or 50 year old. Also Mother Morganic, welcome on in. I'm glad you were able to catch the show. We're doing some butternut squash soup today. You can type an exclamation mark menu. And so I feel like I'm not gonna be the kind of guy that complains about avocado toast because I'll sound like a 40 year old. I'll sound like one of those British like 50 year olds that are like all oh, the youngsters are buying coffee and avocado toast. That being said, I don't love taking an ingredient out of its initial context and out of its initial influence, right? Which is uh, from like a lot of different like Mexican cooking. And then that became like the only way that people ate avocados where it was like, oh my God, I love avocados. How do you like avocados? Avocado toast. It's something about that is incredibly annoying. So I find the entire avocado toast discourse from five years ago, incredibly annoying from every single side of it. It is quite expensive. It is incredibly expensive. Avocados in the United States, I mean, they're, they're so expensive because of the actual cost of transport, um, because it's a very fragile, it's a very delicate food in a lot of ways. So guys, my roasted butternut squash, my sauteed onions, my sauteed garlic, my uh, fennel seed, everything is inside, and we are about to begin on that salad. Everybody that's just joining us, can I please get a yes chef? I wanna make sure that I have all of your attention. Um, also to the new people that are here, I make everybody say yes chef. So it is, it is mandatory, it is part of, you know, the shtick. It's part of the process. So I'm just going to wipe off my cutting board ever so slightly. And now my friends, it is time for us to think about that salad. The goal now is just to get this up to a boil, drop it to a simmer, get all of my vegetables softened. We'll add in some of the half and half, because again, the entire point of today's stream is to use up all of this, all of my excess half and half that I just had laying around. And so we're gonna get it up to a boil, drop it to a simmer, let it cook. And now we are going to just get a jump start on my tomato salad, my friends. So. Let's go ahead and get that going. So I have here a bunch of cherry tomatoes. I have roughly 10 ounces of cherry tomatoes or so. And so guys, here is the issue with tomatoes. This is the thing that I talk about all the time. The biggest thing that it actually comes to mastering what it means to properly cook at home is to understand moisture control. Everything in cooking is either preserving moisture, getting rid of moisture, or adding moisture to something. In this case, the tomato, there is a, fl there is a flaw. There is a flaw with the tomato, especially in a salad format. You put in whole tomatoes into a salad, you know, it's all chunky and it's very unpleasant. I love my chopped salads. Okay, you chop a tomato, you add it to a salad. What is a tomato? It is wet. It is super saturated with liquid. It is absolutely filled to the brim with excess liquid. And so you make a salad, you eat it in five minutes, it's amazing. You put the salad in the fridge. And what happens is your salad becomes soggy. And so we're going to do one of my favorite things, which is to pre-salt the tomatoes. We're going to salt them. We're going to salt them quite heavily. And by getting that done and getting that out of the way, we're going to take out all that excess liquid. The tomatoes will be nice and seasoned, and this will become a much more fridge stable salad, which is my entire intention. So we're going to be using one of my favorite methods to actually slice up a bunch of cherry tomatoes at once. This is a method that you may have seen before, which is we start by taking two things of Tupperware. We take two little Tupperware lids, okay? 
two little Tupperware lids, and all we're going to do, guys, instead of individually taking every single one of these and slicing them in half, I do not have time to do that, okay? We're going to do it this way instead. We're going to take it, and we're just going to stack it up inside of this thing, right, lovely. And I'm gonna glove up for this because I do have eczema, and tomatoes are really, really acidic, right? Guys, look how nice that soup looks. Doesn't that soup look good? We salvaged it, we fixed it, with even with the burnt, uh, butternut squash, right? Let's go ahead and take it, and we're just gonna glove on up. And you remember, you need a nice sharp knife. I'm using my paring knife because it's nice and small and agile. And all I'm gonna do, guys, is I'm gonna get in here. I'm gonna hold it nice and stable, nice and flat. Okay, I'm hanging this off the edge, and we're just going to saw inside, right? So we take it, and we hold it nice and steady. We're not squishing and destroying the tomatoes. And eh, I think this tomato, this knife is a little too short, actually. This knife. We're going to use my uh, chef's knife instead because it's a little longer. It's gonna give us a little bit of easier access. And then we go inside, and now we're just going all the way. I'm being nice and steady, guys. All the way, cut all of them into halves. Beautiful. And now we have some lovely halved up cherry tomatoes. And so, we're going to add these bad boys into a little bowl, and we're going to rinse and repeat with every single one of my tomatoes. Does everybody understand? So look at that. All those tomatoes nicely and beautifully processed. You just need a nice sharp knife. If you don't have a sharp knife, uh, that is a priority and you have to go ahead and get that fixed ASAP. We're going to do this in one more round. We're saving so much time by doing this, right? So much easier. We take it and we put it down. And now guys, same exact thing. We go through all of my lovely tomatoes. There you go. I'm watching them. We went through it nice and flat. Look at that. Into the bowl they go. Last ones. And then I get a little snack. So I love tomatoes and salads, but this is, I think, an essential, essential step. This is not something that you want to skip out on, the pre-salting. Unless you're confident you're going to eat everything immediately, always pre-salt your tomatoes. So guys, my tomatoes have now been beautifully cut in half. And now the goal is to season them with salt, let them sit with the salt for at least 30 minutes or so, my friends. And in 30 minutes, we need to do this in a bowl, not in a strainer. We're then going to strain it out. We want to sit with the salt. The salt is going to pull out all the excess moisture, okay? I'm just gonna turn down the heat on this slightly, just give my pot a little stir. You know me, I love starting problems. I'm a real pot stir, okay? Just let that go and we're just letting this bad boy simmer, my friends. So all that we're going to do is we're going to season this. We're going to intentionally over season my tomatoes because a lot of the water is going, that the salt ends up pulling out is going to hold on to the majority of the salt. I promise you, this looks like a lot of salt. If you take a bite out of this now, you're going to taste it and be like, oh wait, this is way too salty. But the salt is going to penetrate the tomato, so you're not just gonna get hit with a big hit of salt on the outside. And then it'll pull out the liquid and all the liquid that it pulls out will have that excess salt. So intentionally over salt it. I literally want you to taste it at this stage. Taste it. Oh, too salty. That's what you wanna feel. That's what you wanna be hit with. Okay, cleaning as we're going. I'm gonna go ahead and throw these little Tupperwares into my dishwasher really quickly while we have a second to do so. Also, John Dahlia, I'm very excited for you. I hope it goes well. I'm going to go ahead and just rinse off my knife. Just get all that tomato off of it because this is a carbon steel knife and I do end up risking, um, you know, rusting it. All right. so let's give it a big old wipe. Get that nice and dried off and ready to go. And my friends, all we have to do now is just let this tomato sit. Also, uh, Chichu, did I say that correctly? Thank you so much for the prime sub. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate it. So let's just get all of this bad boy nice and wiped off and then we'll proceed with the rest of the stuff for the salad. Guys, I love chopped salads. And in fact, are you guys ready for a rant? Is everybody ready for a food rant? Because I have something to say. I have something to talk about. I'm about to get onto a big extended rant about something. Okay, this is a rant that some of you may have heard before in the past. So I'm just taking a breath. I'm getting ready for this one. I'm getting pumped up. I'm getting amped up, guys. And I'm also just wiping off my knife at the same time. So. My friends, there is something that I despise in this world. There's many things that I hate 
I am in many ways very angry. I have a lot of strong opinions about a lot of different things. Also, there is currently sunlight shining. That is why this is so exposed at the moment. I'm very opinionated. One of my strongest opinions is that I cannot stand for the life of me rustic salads. I cannot stand massive leaves of spinach, or massive leaves of arugula, or massive leaves of radicchio. I hate salads where everything is cut up into massive chunks, where let's say you pick up a leaf and it's coated in like an acidic dressing with like vinegar and lemon, and then you put it into your mouth and you can't open your mouth so wide that it puts in the whole leaf. And so this leaf wipes off all of that acid, all of that dressing, all over your lips, all over your mouth. Your mouth is coated with that acidity and you get one vegetable in your tiny little petite feminine mouth at a time. I cannot stand big cut salads. I love a good chopped salad. A properly chopped salad, you're spooning it in your mouth and you're eating it and you're getting it done. These ridiculous, oh my God, these salads where you have torn radicchio and torn lettuce and it's all in massive pieces and everything is chunked up really, really huge. It is an absolute mess to eat. For me, much of the beauty of the salad is able to get all of these different components into one nice, big, generous bite. I want the salad. I want to get a bite of tomato. I want to get a bite of tomato with the cheese, with the parsley, with the red pepper. We chop salads in this household. I need a yes chef right now, please and thank you. I cannot stand unchopped salads. They're uncomfortable to eat. I hate people making things rustic for the sake of making them rustic. They say, oh, it's rustic, it's so old-fashioned. Explode, okay? It's just inconvenient and it's not functional. Above all else, the way that you cut and you serve and you present your food, first and foremost, needs to be functional. The way that you cut it, the way that you present it, the way that you give it to people, you have to do things for a certain reason. You don't just do things just to make them look nice, especially when it comes at the expense of the actual edibility of something. So when you have a rustic, super chunky salad like that, you know, you're sacrificing so much function just to make it look a little bit prettier. To me, above all else, the most beautiful thing is something that is functional. First worry about the function, and then if something is functional, it is beautiful. Okay, and this is a philosophy that I apply to a lot of different places, but food especially. And I cannot stand for the life of me, chunky, rustic salads. Ugh, it is the absolute worst. So you'll never see me do anything like that. The only exception was my fork and knife salad, right? When the, the tomato mozzarella salad that I did, that was kind of inspired by a caprese. That was really, really chunky, but that was a fork and knife salad. So if you're eating with a fork, it ha ease of access, okay? I'm glad that all of you understand. Chopped salads only. That is the thing that I'm trying to imbue all of you with. The spirit of the chopped salad. Okie dokie. And now, my friends, let us move on. Oh, that was an unintentional stupid pun. I said lettuce, and I felt embarrassed saying that out loud. That was not good. I'm not doing that again. Okay, my friends, we are now going to move on to some of the other components for today's salad. We're going to need eh, maybe like a quarter of this massive red onion here. Okay, what kind of olive? We're doing a calamata today. And also, I have another thing. I have another thing to say right now. I have another thing to say right now. Everybody, are you ready for another Duram Garland? Is everybody ready for another one of these things? Let's take a breath. I'm going to have a sip of water. I have another thing that I need to talk about in the moment. Okay. So, I am not angry at people. I am angry at the lack of understanding about something and people making blanket umbrella statements. So let me say something right now. I'm going to preface this by saying, there is nothing wrong with having a preference. However, most preferences come from a place where somebody has generalized and stereotyped this thing when they don't actually understand what they like or don't like about something. Olives are incredibly controversial. People say all the time that, oh, I hate olives. I can't stand olives. I don't eat olives. And so, here's what I have to say about that. I think the kinds of olives that people say that they hate are the canned black olives. The kind of olives that people say that they hate are the canned black olives. Or maybe the canned green olives, and that's what they think. They think there's these two kinds of olives. There is a massive variety of different kinds of olives out there in a whole big world. It is not their fault. They think that this is the entire world of olives. They think that this is the beginning and the end of olives, that this is what all olives taste like. 
Castel Vetranos are so delicate and so, so, so gentle. Kalamatas are much more robust. There is an entire world of so many different olives that are treated differently to get rid of the bitterness. Some are salty and some are acidic. Some of them are treated and seasoned in different ways. People that say they hate olives have never actually tried and understood the differences between other kinds of olives. The way that most Americans grow up thinking they hate olives are the really crappy black olives that you put on a pizza. And not like a good pizza place in New York, I mean like in the Midwest. Okay, and they think that, oh, you know, this is the crappy olive, right? That maybe the mom pretended to like. It's like, oh, I love olives on pizza. I love a vegetable pizza. I'm stereotyping and I'm mildly misogynistic at the moment, but I know this is true. And so, my friends, there is a big, beautiful world of olives out there. Not every single olive tastes the same. I promise you, if you think you hate one type of olive, I promise you there is an olive out there that you love and enjoy. Can I please get a yes, chef? I wanna make sure that all of you understand this. And so, what does this come back to? Most people, when they say they hate something, when most people say they don't like something, they can't actually dissect properly what they like and they don't like, and they can list like one type of olive and then still find love and enjoyment in another. Your preferences, you have to understand what it is that you specifically like and do not like about something, and its taste, and its texture, and its acidity, and its bitterness, and so forth. You have to understand your own preferences, and that way, you will learn what you love so much more in this world. You will understand the intricacies of, you know, what it means to enjoy and, and, and consume things. So these are some lovely Kalamatas from my Turkish store. I really recommend finding a like Mediterranean supermarket near you, like a Greek supermarket, an Italian one, uh, an Eastern European one, because all of them have olive bars, okay? I did it again. I did the thing with the lettuce and now I said all of them. Oh, um, no, no, no. That was so cringe. That was terrible. That was not intentional. I feel awful about doing that. Okay, my friends, we must now go That was not intentional. That was not, we, we, we gotta go back to this. My computer cringed so hard to put us back onto the starting soon screen. The soup is going. I would argue the soup is a little, bo it's boiling a little too aggressively, so I'm just going to simmer it. Again, I'm just looking to get all the vegetables nice and soft. My tomatoes are sitting with the salt. Let's move on with the rest of the salad ingredients. The next step for today, everybody, is going to be some nice red peppers. I love a good, sweet red pepper in a salad. You can use a green pepper, you can, or excuse me, you can use a yellow pepper, you can use an orange pepper. Green bell peppers are not my favorite in a rock context because they're very vegetal tasting. They taste like a cactus. They taste very vegetal. And so the red bell peppers, the orange ones, the yellow ones, the whichever ones, those are the ones that are typically quite sweet. The green ones I like to save for cooking and make uh, with like sofrito, right? So my friends, here's what I do not want you to do. Let me show you the bad method. The method that I think is suboptimal, unless you're doing a stuffed bell pepper or something. I think the method where you chop off the top of it and then you rip out the seeds, it's clunky and it's annoying and you're not getting nice flat pieces of red bell pepper. So here's what we do. First, we must understand the anatomy. Here's the top. Under the top lies a big pocket of seeds. And along each of these grooves, I want you to pay attention, along each of these grooves is the white spongy part of the red bell pepper. And so here's what we do, my friends. We go in here, okay? We go in and then we shave it off. We shave it off, we shave it off, we shave it off. Hold it nice and flat. If it's wobbly, we just take off the bottom chunk to make it sit a little bit tighter. We take it and you can see, my friends, we've kept the white part intact. And you can see the way that it tapers now that we've made that initial incision. And so we just go in and we get as much of the bell pepper off without wasting any as much as possible. And we shave off and now, guess what? Beautiful, beautifully shaved bell pepper planks just like that. And this is now going to be optimal for some cubing. That's exactly what I wanted to achieve. So let's do the same thing with this next one, right? We're going to make sure that it's sitting. Eh, this one's sitting fairly flat. So I'm going in and we're shaving it, my friends. And we're going in and we're shaving it. And I'm going in and I'm shaving it. And the very last one, I'm going in and I'm shaving it. Beautiful. And now we have this lovely little pile of uh, bell peppers. Lovely. Okay, I'm going to wipe off this bowl and the bell pepper scraps I have put into stocks before. Um, I think that's a nice way of using them up with alternatively compost, but I am not composting. So inapplicable to me that is. Oh, this soup is still, it, it, she is still boiling and toiling. I don't need to be that aggressively cooking. We're just getting all of my vegetables soft and tender and falling apart. So that can take as long as you would like, my friends. You, I don't think you can really overcook this kind of a soup. 
at this stage at least. So, my friends, and now we're going to go ahead and go from planks to batons, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and glove on up just to, again, protect my dainty little eczema ridden hands. It's not easy being done. So let's glove on up. And now my friends, good knife technique. Uh, I like to do all of the batons first and then I like to go ahead and get the dice out, right? So we're going in and we're pulling with the knife and we're getting some medium width batons. Something like this. Because at the end of the day, the kind of cube I'm looking for is about eh, this big. Again, I'm looking for a chopped and processed salad. The tomatoes are gonna be quite big, but the tomatoes are the start of the show. So batons, 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 just slice it up slice it up, get it all done. You can even stack it um, if you really just wanna go that much faster um, because we're only doing two bell peppers. I didn't think stacking would be that necessary, but you can, it's just a little clumsy, right? Because now you gotta make sure that they're staying together, but we are technically going twice as fast now. And again, if you get some of the white part on a red bell pepper, it's fine. It's just kind of spongy and uh, unpleasant. So, there you go. That's these bad boys. And that's these bad boys. And again, guys, we're going to go ahead and cut these up into some nice little cubes. Think about the kinds of pieces that you actually want to be eating in your salad. If you want big chunks, be my guest, but I love a nice properly, properly chopped salad. Okay. And I'm just going to get all of my batons over to one side. I'm going to get the rest of them just out here chilling and hanging out. And now a little bundle at a time. So everybody, one of the most important things to also learn as a home cook is the size of your hands. Specifically, what is the largest amount of mass can you hold if we're stacking them up like this and cutting them? For my hands, this is what about I can do comfortably. I don't want to stack this too much because then they start falling out and escaping with my hands. For a good claw grip, we're looking to pinch it with our pinky and our thumb, and then we're guiding it with our top three fingers. So guys, I'm going for a nice medium to small dice here. For now, I am keeping this a little bit more consistent than I was before, because after all, I'm looking for this to get nice and pretty and beautiful for the salad, okay? And so whenever the cutting board gets nice and crowded like this, guys, let's not force the issue. Let's just go ahead and scoop all of it up and get it all into the bowl, okay? Just scoop it up and into the bowl. So let's do the next little pile. Again, know your hand size. Knowing your hand size is how you stop this kind of a process from being too stressful. I know that this is the amount of material that I can comfortably fit into my palm. And so now we just cube it. We cube it and we cube it. Also, what the hell is my hair doing at the moment? Stop it. There's like a middle part that I'm not too crazy about, okay? And that chunk is done, guys. So let's go ahead and once again, we grab the bench scraper and we scoop all of it up. Is it ponytail time again? I don't know if it's ponytail time. Do we keep mirepoix uh, for today's soup? Well, we didn't already make a mirepoix. We already did. It was the onions and the celery, but the carrot itself was actually properly roasted. So uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't actually sauteed, but it was just roasted. All right, guys. This soup is looking wonderful. We're just gonna keep on cooking. We're gonna get all those vegetables really nice and beautifully soft. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me? Remember, I am here to teach you all how to cook at home. And let's bundle up my red bell peppers. And we're gonna stack her up. And cut them up. There you go. Nice, lovely little cubes, guys. And again, I'm going for a nice, generous batch of vegetables to keep in, a, uh, in my refrigerator for today. All right. That's the whole idea. That's the whole intention. I want a salad that is just stable and ready to go through the fridge, and hence why we're pre-salting the tomatoes. Here's a funny question. Do I grate apples? Um, so Nakopi, people grate apples for like a Japanese curry or sometimes when they do like a galbi, uh, they will like, maybe not an apple, but like a pear. But sometimes people do depending on the context. Um, or uh, there's like a couple of like Russian desserts that would call for like a grated apple. Can mushrooms be incorporated to these types of salads? So Ben Zukov, yes. However, I think uh, only cooked mushrooms. I actually cannot stand for the life of me raw mushrooms. I think raw mushrooms are some sort of a psyop. I genuinely do not know how it happened, but raw mushrooms getting offered at like sandwich places and salad bars, I've never understood it even for a second. 
like white button mushrooms when they're raw, completely uncomfortable texture and unpleasant taste. And so you can absolutely do cooked mushrooms in a salad. I love cooked mushrooms, right? But I've never had a raw mushroom minus, I don't know, a truffle, but that's not particularly a mushroom, right? Uh, where I've ever been like, yes, this needs to be raw. I think it's a psyop. I genuinely think it's a psyop. I do not know anybody that genuinely wants you know, that's to be the uh, thing. Are you mushrooms a carcinogen? Dakota, you would know more than I in this case. Uh, a lot of things are carcinogens though. So, you know, we can, that's, that's like a whole greater discussion about like barbecue and stuff. And so I'm not as preoccupied with that as I am with just the fact that I feel like they're really unpleasant to eat. But you could be right. Also, hi Dakota. I just want to say hi to you again. Um, okay, okay, guys. So look, all of this beautiful red bell pepper. Again, I'm looking for a bunch of salad. I'm looking for enough salad that I go into the fridge and I keep on filling up my little lunch tray or whatever else. Okay, I love fridge salads. That's what it means to cook at home, my friends. Cooking at home is not about making one thing every single day of the week. Cooking at home is to know the kinds of things that you like to eat and to build those up in your fridge so that you have a really, really nice, pleasant supply of it. Okay, so that whenever you're hungry for that one specific thing that, hey, it's there and she's waiting for you and she's ready to go. Right? And so this is the kind of a salad that I know that I personally love and adore to eat. So guys, let's go ahead and we'll get the rest of the onion processed. Um, we're actually going to do something that I love doing with onions. So let's get a little bowl for that separately. We need to separate the onions. So my friends, I have a question for you. What is the biggest issue with a raw onion in a salad. Does anybody know what is the biggest, the number one problem that I personally have with a raw onion? A raw onion, my friends. If anything, she is pungent. She is unpleasantly pungent sometimes. A raw red onion, probably one of the worst offenders of this. And so, we're going to do something that I love doing. We're not gonna pickle the onion, we're not gonna cook the onion, we're not gonna do anything crazy. We're going to be adding in some vinegar and we're going to slice the onion and we're going to let it sit with the vinegar. The vinegar is going to help to kill some of the pungency and that vinegar is still acidity that we're going to need for the salad anyways. Today, I'm going to be using a red wine vinegar. You can use whichever acid that you would like for the salad. You can even use lime juice. You can do whatever you want in this case. So, I have my onion cut halved. I'm just going to go ahead and peel it up really quickly. Right, I'm gonna be using just half an onion for today because again, I'm not looking to kill the salad with pungency. I'm also going to go back and give my soup a little stir. And guys, for the chopped salad, I'm looking for some thinly, thinly sliced onions, okay? Uh, we're not going to be building a vinaigrette mood, huh? Uh, especially because fridge, you know, ones don't, they don't, they don't last particularly long. So. I just cut my onion in half lengthwise. I didn't mean to cut in half that first time. And all I'm going to do, guys, we're slicing it pole to pole. We're slicing it parallel to the grain of the onion itself. We're going to now just obtain super, super thin, thin slices. That's the kind of slices that I want in my salad. Okay? Thin, 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 thin. You can use a mandolin. You know, you can do whatever you want to get it done. It doesn't have to be paper thin, but I just want it to be nice and thin, my friends. Nice and thin. There we go. Okay, let's just move all of that aside for a second. Lovely. All of this red onion. This is a massive red onion, guys. And so again, you don't have to use red onion for a salad like this. You can use any type of allium that you actually prefer. You can use leeks. You can use uh, scallions. I just love raw red onions, especially because of the lovely little color that they have. So guys, thin, 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 all the way through a bunch of red onions. And again, normally this right here has enough pungency that it will make any salad unpleasant to eat. Okay, some of these still pieces are a little too thick for me. So I'm just going back through and just slicing it up again. And okay, I think that looks good. So nice thin slices, guys. I'm going to get all of this onion just transferred into my bowl that we've set aside. Okay. There we go. Does anybody have any cooking questions for me? It can be about this dish. It can be about anything that you would like. Because remember, I am here to help you. That's you, you specifically. I'm here to help you learn how to cook. And I'm just gonna clean up my station really quickly. And so guys, all that I'm going to do now is we're just gonna drizzle it with some vinegar and we're going to let it sit. We're going to let it sit separately, much like the tomatoes, except in this case, we're doing it with the intention of killing the pungency of the onion. Does everybody understand? Does anybody have any questions? I wanna hear a nice yes, chef. 
please and thank you. So just drag off my hands. And now I'm just going to get a glove on. I wanna make sure that all of you are listening and all of you are attentive. So that's why I need all these yes chefs. Guys, I love these kinds of fridge salads. To me, they are the ideal home food. Uh, the ice water rinse. So, um, yeah, you can do the ice water rinse cap on. I just find that the vinegar is a little bit more effective and it's a little bit easier because we still need this for the salad anyways. We're still going to be having this be a factor in the salad. So um, we're just using its natural properties here, right? So we're just separately, a couple of big drizzles of the red wine vinegar all the way around and not too much. Again, all this is still going to go back into the salad. We're not straining this out or anything. There you go. That should be perfect. Just to get them a little bit coated, my friends. And we're just gonna let this sit by itself. And they're going to stain a little bit too, right? We're just gonna break up the clusters. Just give it a little bit to sit on its own. That's right, so this is one of my favorite things in cooking, right? It is when something isn't just functional, right? But it also serves a purpose for us. So the vinegar, we would still want it in the final product. We would still want it in the final salad, but we are harnessing its property, its ability to give us a perfect onion as well at the same time. So everything just ends up working out that way. I'm going to get a couple of things thrown into my dishwasher yet again. I hope you've all been enjoying the cooking show. For those of you that haven't already done so, please, please, please. I'm actually gonna get serious about this. If you would like to support the cooking show, if you would like to support what we do here, everybody, please check out my Patreon. You can type in exclamation mark Patreon. My goal is to be able to do this full time. I would love to be able to teach you all how to cook at home. Um, and so any and all help there is appreciated. I don't want to take sponsors. I want to disable all the ads on Twitch. Um, and I want to keep this free for everybody to watch. So if you have a little bit of excess pocket change, um, any and all help on the Patreon would go a super long way. I am going to quickly rinse off my knife because again, my knife was just cutting up a bunch of different vegetables and I don't want to let it sit with anything because it is carbon steel. You typically have a stainless steel knife. You don't need to do what I'm doing unless you also, for some reason, have a carbon steel knife. I love carbon steel though. Carbon steel, such an ideal uh, material for a knife like this just because, I mean, it just holds an edge so much better than stainless steel but it is not a beginning material at all. Okay guys, so we have all the salad ingredients kind of sitting and chilling out for a little bit. And so I think this would maybe be a good time for us to get a blend on. What do you think? Is it blend time? Are we blender moding? Or do we keep making a salad? What do you guys think? Ooh, yeah, we got a lot of evaporation here. We're just going to sub in with some half and half and then like more liquid as also needed, but it'll be good. I think it might be blending time actually. Yeah, they're, they're absolutely resist. They're, they're not resistant to stains. They do build up a patina. Uh, do I ever use those Chinese style cleavers? No shark dog, I do not. I would like a cleaver for a couple of things. I just don't have a particular use for one. Uh, the only reason I would need like a cleaver or a hatchet, I guess, would be if I need to cut through bone sometimes, but I also never chop, I only slice. And so cleavers, I do find them a little heavy for my little hands sometimes as well. Okay, okay. So, my friends, let's go ahead. Yeah, and they do work as a bench cleaver, but again, I don't like dragging the edge of a knife on anything. My friends, we are going to go ahead and begin the blending stage. So, let me have a sip of water. Is everybody ready to begin the blending? I wanna hear the yes chef right now, please and thank you. Now is the time to do it, everybody. Now is your time. So, let's head to the stove and let's set up my blending station. So as always, guys, we have a little tofu plate so we will be using something today called an immersion blender. There's three kinds of blenders that you need to know about, three kinds of blender classifications. The first, my friends, is this bad boy right here. This is called an immersion blender, okay? And again, this might seem obvious to some of you. I just want to talk about equipment safety and differences really quickly because I think this stuff is really important. This is an immersion blender. Immersion blenders, or a stick blender, they're really, really nice because you get to go ahead and separately uh, without any other additional vessel, you're able to go ahead and blend inside of a pot or something. So they're very handy, they're very handy, they're very mobile, they're very agile for that reason. I'm just going to go ahead and unplug this bad boy and get this all plugged in and ready to go. So this is the first kind of blender. So the dangers of this are what? Uh, the problem is it's not very good for thicker blends, so it's very good for like creamy soups, but if you're looking for something a little bit thicker, like a smoothie, uh, it doesn't do that well, especially with raw ingredients. So this does a really nice job of cooked ingredients, of very soft ingredients, of maybe you know making a mayonnaise with it as well is also really good, um, but it does not do a good job 
with uh, like a smoothie. Second kind of blender, my friends, is what I like to call a closed top blender. This is my new trip bullet. I hate these things. I think these things suck. But a closed top blender is any blender where it doesn't have an air vent. It essentially has a blender cup and then it also has a blender blade. So here's a blender cup and then a blade would screw on. And so if you have one of these, and you want to make a soup like this, you need to let this cool down. I need a Yes Chef right now. I need to hear it again. If you have one of these blenders and you want to blend in this, you have to let it cool down. Why? Well, if this is hot and it's enclosed and it's blending and getting even hotter, you're building up a bunch of pressure inside. It's bad for the blender and when you open it, it all explodes out. The third kind of blender, the ideal kind of blender, is the open top blender. Think of a Vitamix, there's a bunch of brands that do open top blenders, but open top blenders, I don't own one, are ones that have an air vent on the top and that allows steam to escape. Okay, and the beauty of allowing the steam to escape in that case is that, you know, you can blend hot things inside of it. And so those are the three kinds of blenders. And I'll be showing you how to do this, of course, with a stick blender today. And guys, this is going to start first with a bunch of half and half. This was one of the reasons I wanted to do this dish was to get rid of a bunch of half and half. Also, hello, SSBM Dad, welcome on it. So guys, we're getting in a bunch of half and half in this. Uh, it's half cream, half milk, right? Let's get a bunch of it inside, and this is going to help give the soup a really nice, beautiful, creamy feel. It's also going to go ahead and get the oil all incorporated. It's not purely heavy cream, guys. This is half and half. Is a Blendtec an open vent blender? Nicopi, if it has a hole on the top, then yes. And I believe Blendtecs are indeed, uh, you know, open top. I'm fairly certain. Okay, guys, and so all that we're going to do, we're going to make sure that we're starting off on the low setting. And with blender safety, you need to make sure that all the holes of the blender are nicely covered. So, lowest setting, we're just going to first get rid of all of the super big chunks. All the big, big, big chunks, guys. We're going to get those processed, and then we're going to go on the high speed to get it smooth and creamy. And this is the beginning, guys, of an incredible soup. In fact, while I am blending, all I'm going to do really quickly is I'm going to take the chat with me so I can talk to you guys while I'm blending. How's that sound? Does that sound good to all of you? So I'm going to actually probably just turn off this and just head to this now. So you guys won't be able to see me for a second. Is that okay? Or do you prefer still seeing me with the other camera? I think this looks nicer. So guys, we're just getting all the big chunks processed on the lowest setting at the moment. Okay. And then when we go on to the fine setting, I don't like doing the big chunks on a super fine setting uh, because it tends to splash up a little bit more. So getting it processed on a low speed first and then turning it up has always been my way to go. And now that we've done exactly that, exactly as promised, high speed blending action. This is where we go from a chunky mess into a beautiful, delicious butternut squash soup. Nice and thick and rich and smooth and creamy, everybody. Nice and smoky and roasted with all of those incredible spices on the inside, that chicken bouillon. This thing is full of flavor. What is my take on pressure cookers? Nicopi, I think every home cook needs one. In fact, I do all of my chicken stocks and all of my beans in them. I think people shouldn't saute in them, but I think for chicken stocks and beans and that kind of stuff, they're amazing to have. Okay guys, we're getting all of this blended. We're gonna get this blended as much as you would like to the viscosity that you would like. You can even strain the soup if you would like. I think straining at home is a bit of a headache though, so I don't personally do it. Oh yeah, it's getting there my friends. We are now obtaining a beautiful, delicious, creamy viscosity. A really, really beautiful butternut squash soup. I'm just going to go in there with my spoon because sometimes the blender doesn't do a very good job of distributing all the chunks. So I'm just going to mix it around a little bit and back to the blending we go, my friends. So how do I make stock in a pressure cooker? Uh, Nicopi, the way that I do stocks in a pressure cooker, I do like a chicken carcass, two quarts of water, half an onion, whatever vegetable scraps you have, high pressure, 50 minutes, that easy. That's how easy it is. I don't roast the bones. I don't mess around with anything. I keep it really simple. You want it to be thinner than water? That's just beyond that. I don't believe that's actually physically possible. But guys, look at this delicious, beautiful, velvety, creamy, delicious soup. 
all of the carrots, all the squash, all the celery and all the onions. Everything is now coming together in harmony. Everything is becoming beautifully, beautifully, beautifully processed. Uh, 50 minutes, five onokopi. That's it. That's all that this process takes, guys. And it takes a little bit of patience, especially if you're using a stick blender. What's your... SSBM dot, what's your, what's your government name? Also, I forget, are you the SSBM dot? Oh, wait, wait. Oh, you, are you Freddy? Is it Freddy? Is that you? Has that been you the whole time? Because there's two SSBM dads. Am I stupid? Have I not known that it was you the whole time? Because I mixed, I think I mixed you up with somebody else. All right, hi, Freddy. It's good to see you. Sorry, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot you tagged for a second. Anyways, guys, we're blending the soup. We're getting a beautiful viscosity here. We're getting it all nice and smooth. What should I use for seafood stock? So, Nikopi, I haven't made a lot of seafood stocks. The kind of seafood stocks that I've made have been shrimp stocks. So, shrimp stocks, here's what I recommend. I, rec I recommend that you check out America's Test Kitchen video on shrimp stocks. Um, and then you see the cook time, and you see that a shrimp stock only takes 15 minutes of cooking. Um, but as for fish bones, the reason I don't make sh uh, fish stocks is because, you know, I don't actually typically have access to fish because I don't work with whole fish. So guys, we're almost done. I know this has taken a while. I know that we have to be nice and patient. We just have to be nice and patient. We have to get it through. Look how beautiful this is. Look how rich it is. Let's get rid of every single last possible chunk that's inside though. Because I'm not looking for the chunky soup, my friends. I'm looking for rich, delicious, thick, and creamy soup. Everything has been properly cooked through, so everything is just blending in so nicely. There we go. And again, if you wanted to, you can strain this out, and an open top blender would probably do a much better job than this will, but we gotta do what we gotta do. Country girls make do, my friends. Okay. I think that is looking pretty good. I think that looks done at the moment. Guys always have this separate little plate here that is just ready to go because it makes it a lot easier to take out the blended uh, stick. And now let's go give this thing a nice little taste. So I think for me, that might be actually a little too viscous for what I'm looking for. So we might thin this out with some water in a second, but, oh. Oh my God. That. Mm. That is so good. That is so rich. That is so delicious. I want it to be a little bit thinner. That is perfect. That, my friends, is a beautiful, beautiful soup. That texture, that viscosity, incredible. Mm. Yeah, a little too thick. So, we'll just get some water inside. Okay. And it's going to blend in because we have all of that starch. Nothing's going to split. So we'll just add in a little bit of water and then we'll just blend it in and mix it through. So let's do, you know, and again, I'm going purely by feel, purely by vibes here. So I'm not measuring anything out. Okay. And now let's go ahead and get that mixed in. And I've been known to make egregiously thick soups in the past. This is not one that I want to be that thick. So just blend it all in. Let's get it done. All of it mixed in, my friends. There we go. I think that's a little bit better, right? I think that's a little bit better. That's a little creamy instead of like thick and cakey. That's better. That's a little bit more of what I'm looking for, I think. Okay, okay. Does anybody have any cooking questions? Is everybody still paying attention? I know that this is a repetitive, long process. I just want to hear another yes chef from everybody watching. I want to make sure that you're all engaged, that you're all here, and you're all ready to still learn. Okay, and we're almost done, everybody. We're almost done. I know. I know that this takes a while. I just want to get all that water incorporated. In fact, I'm thinking a little teeny tiny bit thinner too. That, might, that looks good, but I just want a little bit more water. And now let's get that inside. 
I'm not looking for the soup to be so good that it's just like clogging your mouth and your arteries. That's not enough yes chefs. That is truthfully not enough yes chefs. Let's try that again. Is everybody paying attention? Is everybody listening? From everybody watching right now. That's much better. Let's not have that happen again, please. Okay, okay. I think I am just going to go ahead and call this soup done. That is perfect. That is now lovely and wonderful and blended up, guys. Look at that soup. Look at that soup, huh? That is a beautiful, homemade, completely from scratch, butternut squash soup using simple materials made into something much greater than the sum of all of its parts. So let's go ahead and have a little taste. Mm. Delicious, delicious. Roasted and flavorful and herbaceous. That has everything that I could possibly want. Everything, everything. That is gorgeous, my friends. So I'll just give that a little stir all the way through. Look at this soup. Nice and aerated too. Nice and light. Yeah, that's a much better viscosity, guys. I think my days of super thick, utterly clogging soups are, are over. And now, we have to do like a gratuitous shot for like a thumbnail, I think. I think that'll be important for this. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and take like a ladle. And so, uh, Jack, I'll get to your question in a second. I'm just trying to get something for a thumbnail. I apologize for, you know, doing this gratuitous nothing shot that gets absolutely nothing done. It's all for the content, baby. Everything is about the content at the end of the day. There we go. All right, I think that's enough scooping. That's enough, that's done. No more, no more scooping to be had. My friends, we have done it, we have finished the soup, and now it is time for us to finish up the salad component as well. We're not gonna melt some, no. I would never do such a thing. I will never do a, a cheese pull on a soup. Terrible. So what is my opinion on eggs? Um, uh, you know, good quality eggs are pretty inaccessible for most people, as in if they come from the right place. Here's my thing, I think all animal husbandry is pretty much unethical as in all of the raising of animals and using them for like dairy and, and meat. I think all of it is unethical. That's what I think. But I'm the world's biggest hypocrite because I haven't gone vegan, have I? So I feel like I'm a little unqualified to say anything about it. So guys, guess what? We have had these onions lovely and beautifully soaking in all this vinegar so that we kill the pungency. Let's just give it a little taste. Yep, none of that pungency, none of that hit, just good sweetness and good acidity. We have all of my bell peppers. And now my friends, let's go ahead and move on with the rest of the components for today's salad. We have to do the cheese and we have to do the olives. Uh, Amnu, what's this? Well, welcome, Gubella. How'd you find the stream? This is the best cooking show on Twitch. So we made this beautiful, gorgeous butternut squash soup. And now we're finishing up this really, really lovely salad that we're doing. So we have these bell peppers that have been chopped up. We have these onions that have been sitting with a bunch of red wine vinegar just to get them, uh, just to kill some of that pungency. We have these tomatoes sitting with salt to get rid of all of that excess moisture, okay? All that excess liquid that would have otherwise made a salad soggy. We're having it sit with that salt. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and put these bad boys behind me. Put it all behind me, put it into my past. Okay? And now, let's think about what else we actually need to get done for the salad. We have to do the olives, and we also have to do the cheese. So, let's go ahead and get some of these olives done, my friends. So I have here some lovely, gorgeous Kalamata olives. Uh, you added sasan uh, to some fried potato skins. Tarina, that sounds lovely. I love sasan. One of my favorite spice mixes. I don't usually love spice mixes, but that's one of my favorites. And so, we gotta think about the best way to actually process these. Um, I think I'm just going to double glove and just like smash them to get like the pit out, right? Because these are pit in olives. So they are a little bit more annoying. They're a little bit more hectic to work with. So I'm going to just give each one of these guys a little squash and then out comes, if we give it a proper squash, out comes the entirety of the pit in one go. Okay, and so guys, we wanna do this with every single one of these olives. I know this might seem like a bit of a headache, and guess what, it is, but this is essential because you do not want to end up with a pit in your salad. So we're just going to go ahead and squish it, 
and just get the pit out. There you go. No, this was not a squash pun. This was not a squash pun, Selena. Let's not make it that, please. So let's get all of them out. And it's okay that they're getting squished, guys. They're just going to integrate into the salad really, really well. Um, I don't actually have an amazing way of getting them out. So this is what I've always done, which is I just press them and I get rid of them, right? Just like this. There you go. Each one of them plucked out, nice and ready to go. Ugh. An olive pitter is maybe a reasonable single use kitchen tool. I have never used an olive pitter before. That might actually be a really good investment for me because I do cook with olives quite often. And so this is what I've just always done, which is, you know, I'm okay with like mashing and destroying them slightly because I'm always just going to chop them up into a salad anyways, right? So maybe I should invest in an olive pitter. I've just never, I've never used one. I've never saw a seen a need for it. Thank you for the suggestion though. Okay, squish with the outside of a teaspoon. Well, I'm just pressing them down guys. And I'm getting just the pits out like this with thumb down on the concave side. Okay, well, we'll give that a shot as well. Um, does anybody have any cooking questions for me in the meantime though? So you're saying spoon concave down. What is, what does that accomplish for us? It just pops out like a little pocket. I don't know, I think my method was doing just, well, that does seem to work just fine. I do think just using my thumb though, and then able to like carve it open, does work just as well though. Yeah, that seems to be okay. Everybody, I know this is a bit of a slow process, this is a bit of a mundane process, but we have to get it done. This is a really, really good time to ask me any and all cooking questions that you may have. Because remember, I am here to teach you, that's you, I'm here to teach you how to cook at home. So it can be about this dish, it can be about something else. You can talk about anything that you would like at the moment. Well, I'm glad that you are it, Selena, because not everybody necessarily always is, but that's okay. We're getting through it. We're getting through it slowly, but surely. Some of them are a little like tougher to de-pit than, than others are too. So they're a little bit inconsistent. But yes, I do employ it because it can be, there's no such thing as a bad question on this cooking stream, right? I'm here to help people how to cook at home at all levels. And I could probably use some work in the field of actually pitting some olives. And again, some of them are just going to be a little bit more troublesome than others, right? Depending on the ripeness, depending on how well they actually brined. There's a lot of different factors to actually consider here. So some of the older, the older and like mushier that they are. Um, okay. So, uh, Cap on stream asked, uh, earlier you mentioned not going stock and going bouillon. What ratios would I recommend for bouillon to water? I don't have a hard ratio, so what I would do, Cap, is I would start with like two teaspoons at a time, and then I would taste it, and then I would figure out what I would want for my tastes. I felt confident to go in with like my big tablespoon of it, because I've cooked with it so much, but if you're quite new to using it as a product, I would just recommend a couple of teaspoons, and then just taste it after it like cooks in a little bit. Does that answer your question, Cap on stream? And I mean like a couple of teaspoons for like a small pot, for like a big pot, start with like a tablespoon. So a tablespoon and just taste it. You can always taste, you can always, always adjust it. Okay, that is the beauty of this kind of cooking. There's always room to adjust it. There's nothing that's actually final. Give it a big old press. Ah, oh, there we go. And just pop that coil out, pop that pit out. Lovely. Guys, we're getting a big, beautiful pile of olives here. We don't need all of these olives, surely. I just want a bunch of them in this salad. Because I adore olives, one of my favorite things to eat. It's really delicious kalamatas. Ah, okay, guys, we're making good work. We're almost done. I'm just going to do maybe like three more olives, okay? Thank you all for being patient with me throughout this process. I know that this is a bit of an annoying one. I know, I know, and I do apologize sincerely, but it will all be over soon. Your suffering will end in just a moment's time. I promise you that. Okay, two more olives. Just press it and, ooh, this one's a tough one. Yeah, this one's not gonna wanna come out, is he? And we got him out. We coaxed him out. And one last one. Love olives. Can't get enough of them, really. Okay. I think that is now a nice... Pr and one more. One more. One more olive. Ooh, this one's... This one's... Yeah, this one. This one's not coming out. That one I already just gave that a little test. Yeah, he's not happening. Some of them are really, really tough. Okay. There we go. The rest of those are going to be for snacking. Let's go ahead and get all these pits out of here, guys. 
We have no use for all those olive pits, hogged as rocks. Get them out of here. No use in my kitchen. So, guys, all that I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go ahead and chop up each of my smashed up olives. And in doing so, we're also feeling for any pits that we might have accidentally left inside. Because the last thing that we want to ever have is to be able to bite into a pit that is just going to suck for everybody involved. Okay? You do not want to bite into an olive pit. So be diligent. Be diligent. Take your time. Feel with your hands. Feel all of these little pieces. Scoop them up and put them into your salad bowl. Okay, take it and chop it and chop it. And if you feel anything hard, that's why we're just going back in with your hands. Okay, your hands are the best way to feel for these kinds of things. You're giving this to somebody else. You are responsible for them biting into or not biting into an olive. You are, you're, you're the one that is in control of their destinies. So be diligent, my friends. Nice small pieces, because again, I want this olive to properly mix into the salad. Okay. And let's get a big scoop in. Lovely. And let's get all of these bad boys nice and processed. And guys, we're going to have a delicious salad by the end of this. It's going to be incredible. We have a few more things to get through though. Because after this, we have to do the parsley and then the cheese. Would I keep a duck as a pet? Uh, no, because I'm not crazy about pets in general, Jack. I'm not a pet guy. So probably not. The only kind that I would probably keep would be like a real proper terrarium with like a reptile. Right, because I did that when I was younger. I used to have a tortoise. Um, okay, let's go ahead and get that all into the bowl. And I'm going to mix all that up. But yeah, I am not one to be much of a pet guy. I am afraid. Okay, this cutting board is going to need quite a bit of cleaning. I'm going to just get rid of all of my olives now. Put them into my fridge. Away she all goes. Okay, and now let's go ahead and just get rid of this and let's get rid of this and my friends it is time for the patented lecture on how to slice herbs are you all ready for this one because this is going to be the same lecture that you've all heard over and over again is there anybody here who's new or anybody here that's just fairly new i'm actually quite curious now's a very good chance to speak up because we're going to be doing something that i think is essential that not enough people do so Anybody that's new, I want to hear like a me chef or something just to, because I just want to know. Okay, my friends, we have a bunch of parsley that we need to go through for the salad today. That was one of my intentions, right? Which was to use up a lot of my excess parsley that I had sitting and chilling in my fridge. And this kind of a salad is sort of like really Mediterranean vibe salad, right? This is going to be perfect for such an occasion. So, everybody, parsley. I cannot stand the stems. You're no good at chopping herbs? November, you're in the right place. Also, yes, Freddy, talk to me. What's your question? But you're in the right place. So guys, we're gonna pick them off the stems. Okay, well, sparkers, it's lovely to have you here. Um, guys, we're just gonna pluck them off the stems because the stems are a little too woody. You can keep them on if you would like, but I find parsley stems to be quite unpleasant. Is there a difference between cilantro and coriander? No, cilantro and coriander is just used by different uh, people or whenever they're talking about cilantro in a mexican context they say cilantro whenever they meet it in a mediterranean or chinese context they say coriander coriander and cilantro are identical two words for the same thing so that is a good question you're not being dumb at all and no such thing as a dumb question so guys this process is going to just take a little bit of time again i just want to go ahead and get rid of all of these stems i don't like the texture of the stems in a raw salad especially right even though the stems have flavor the texture is so fibrous and, and woody it's ugh, it sucks so guys let's pluck it and so while i'm plucking i'm gonna have a sip of water actually we that's us we are going to talk about one of the things that I absolutely hate the most when people chop herbs. They go in there and they chop them. The number one mistake is chopping. There is a difference in cooking between chopping and slicing. Chopping is what you do to a tree. A chopping is a purely downwards motion. A slice is when you use the full length of your knife. One of them is delicate and cleanly cuts something and the other crushes them. You need to consider yourself in a kitchen when you're handling something as delicate as herbs. You need to consider yourself as a surgeon. I need a yes chef right now. I need to make sure that you're all listening to this. 
Some things are more volatile than others. Some things are more delicate than others. The issue with crushing herbs, when you crush the cells of the cilantro or the parsley or whichever fresh herb, when you crush them, you're releasing all that chlorophyll, all that flavor, and it oxidizes, turns brown, loses its color, and loses its flavor. And so, when you chop herbs and you mince them, and you crush them, that's what happens, and they lose all of their longevity. And so, people say, oh, you should never slice or chop fresh herbs. Absolute nonsense. Let me show you how. My friends, the key is a delicate slice to get small herbs. We just have to slice it and let me show you how this is done. Everybody, we take the herbs, we take it in our hands, we roll it up and we bundle it up nice and dry. Okay, they're not soaking wet. They were put into a salad spinner. They were put into a container. Okay, so my friends, we go ahead and we take this bundle of parsley and we roll it up and we hold it you see why people are saying baby bird? We hold it like a baby bird. Not so firmly that we crush its little brains out, but not so gently that it flies away. So let's take it in our hands and we're going to gently just bundle it up and put it down on a cutting board. Here's our little baby bird, guys. Let's get it all together. Let's get it all bundled up and ready to go. And the key is a slice. You take your little baby bird and a nice thin slice with the full length of your knife, gentle, no vertical force whatsoever. We're just pulling this and letting the knife do all of the work. We're not chopping it. We're not crushing it. We're not destroying it. You'll know if you crush an herb, if your cutting board looks wet after. That's the baby bird with all of its guts and blood out on the cutting board. You want to slice it gently, gently. We're not crushing it. We're not destroying it. We're not going down like this. So look at how intact they are, despite the fact that we're slicing them. Despite the fact that we're processing it, we're not crushing the cells. We're doing minimal damage to the herb itself, my friends. And then we're getting some beautifully sliced parsley as a result. Beautifully sliced, truly. Okay, we take it, and then we're just going to take these stems out, because we have no use for the stems. And now, my friends... We give this whole thing a nice little 90 degree turn. November gate, this is for you. This is how you slice herbs. You need a sharp knife. And look, nothing is sticking. The cutting board isn't wet. They're staying nice and beautiful and vibrant and green. And now guys, we just take it and we bundle up this bad boy again. And then we just slice it one more time. Again, minimal vertical force. I just hate big leaves of parsley. They have a very like t big tendency to like stick to your mouth when I get like a really big leaf. And so I like them finely minced, but we don't chop them. We don't crush them. We don't destroy them. Okay. All we do, my friends, is that gentle slice. And look at my beautiful herbs. Look how nice and green they are. They're not destroyed. They're not obliterated into nothingness. That is what a proper sliced herb looks like. That is the difference between chopping and slicing. And now let me show you something. Let me show you guys something. Let me sacrifice a little bit of this baby bird to show you what not to do. Here is the technique that people show off over and over again. You know what they call this? They call this a rock chop. They take something and they take it. And this is so bad for your knife and this is so bad for the thing you're cutting. And they do this, they do this, and they do this, and they crush it and they chop it over and over and over again. And then look, it's sticking to your knife and my finger is turning green because that's all of its guts out. And then they go back in and they do it again. And this type of aggressive motion, my friends, you're decimating, you're destroying the herbs. They're going to turn brown and oxidize because you've just crushed all those cells. It is an absolute waste. I'm still gonna put into the salad but we would have just effectively destroyed it. I never want to see you all doing that. So guys, the olives, the red pepper, and now we're also going to throw in my onions that have been sitting in the vinegar so that they go ahead and lose some of the pungency. This is going to be a beautiful, beautiful salad, my friends. All right, let's get all of those onions into the bowl now, officially. Ready to go. Gorgeous. Okay, and now I'm also going to be straining out my tomatoes. Don't forget the tomatoes that have been sitting with the salt, guys. Let me show you how much water comes out. So I'm going to now take my salad bowl and put it behind me. Guys, I'm going to strain out my tomatoes. I want you all to see with your own eyes. I want you all to see exactly how much comes out. You ready for this? Look at all of this water that would have otherwise ended up in your salad. All of this tomato water would have gone in there and made that salad soggy. So 
We're straining it. We're just letting it chill out for a little bit. We've seasoned tomatoes now. Okay, we can in fact just dump out this liquid and just continue just to let it strain just for a little bit longer. Okay, my friends? Just let it strain and then we'll also throw into the salad. The last step, the last thing that we actually have to process for the salad, guys, is going to be the cheese component. I have here a Turkish cheese. This is a Turkish sheep's cheese. It's gonna be nice and pungent. Uh, I believe it's called Mervain. Pretty sure, something like that. Let's go ahead and open it up. It should be similar-ish to a feta. I believe. Can somebody check me on a movie? Ooh, it is pungent. It is intense. Gorgeous. That is my big block. And again, I'm looking for that pungent, delicious sheep's cheese. Flavorful, delicious. I'm gonna glove up for this actually, because this is a bit of a messy process, cutting this type of cheese. And we're also gonna taste the cheese and see what it's like. We might want only very little of it, depending on actually how pungent it really is, right? So let's take it and let's just hack off a little slice of it. Right, it's a sheep cheese, so it's a lot gamier than a cow cheese. Mm. That is delicious, but that is intense. So guys, with the feta or your mervé, whatever that you have, all I'm going to do, guys, is I'm just going to chop this up into little cubes. Little cubes. I don't just want to bite into a chunk of this cheese because this cheese is so intense on its own. But in the context of all of the salad stuff, it's going to be perfect. So let's get another nice big slice. And again, just chop it into lengths and grab it and cut it up into little teeny tiny cubes, my friends. Crumble it. Properly crumble it. I don't want this cheese in massive chunks, in massive pieces in the salad. Do you understand? I need a yes chef right now. It is pungent, it is intense, it's delicious, but we need to be able to counter that pungency with all of the other salad ingredients. And so it needs to be evenly and properly distributed. So we take it and we cut it up into strips again, and we take it and we cut it into little chunks. It's like a very, very intense, very pungent feta. It's super, super good. Okay, it's a little bit drier than a typical feta because as you see, it stands up to being cut up a lot easier too. Beautiful. And I think that is the amount of cheese that I'm going to need for today's salad, guys. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer that. That is a stinky cheese. It's lovely though. Embrace it, counter it with all the other things that you'll be adding to it, okay, my friends? I'm just gonna get in some plastic wrap and throw that back on into my fridge. But yeah, I don't know much about this cheese. I saw this in my Turkish grocery store, and so I wanted it. And I think I will be pleasantly rewarded with the outcome. It's intense, it's gonna be delicious, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw this into a container in the fridge, and then I'll figure out what to do with it another time. Okay? And guys, we're going to go ahead and get the rest of the stuff into the salad. Are you all ready for the great assembly of the salad? It is time, my friends. We have done everything that we possibly needed to for today. So I am just going to go ahead and scoop up my tomatoes and throw that into my salad bowl. Okay, that has now been officially done. Lovely. And I'm just going to get these bad boys into my dishwasher while I just have a second of time. Really quickly, guys, we're about to get done. We're about to mix up this lovely, beautiful salad. All right, and now let's go ahead. John Dahlia, thank you for being here. As always, your presence and company is always welcome. Let's get all of this cheese, using my bench scraper, inside of my salad bowl. And I don't think we're going to need any salt because the tomatoes are salted, the cheese is really, really salty, and the olives are salty. So, there will be no need for any additional salt in the salad, but we will still hit it with a bunch of black pepper and olive oil. Okay, and this very last part, lovely. Okay guys, really quickly, I'm just going to go ahead and wash off my knife one last time. Are you all ready for the combination of the salad? Are you all ready for the mixing of the salad? This is the last step of today. So I'm just gonna wash off my knife, get rid of all of the cheese that is on it really quickly, just while I have a second of time to do so. All of the cheese is off. 
And now, my friends, it is time for us to mix. I don't think that's enough yes chefs. Let's try that one more time. This is the last hurrah. This is the last step of today, everybody. I want to hear a nice, resounding yes chef from every last person watching, even if you've been doing it all day. Even if you've been doing it all day, maybe chef? Death coil, that's not enough. This is the last step, so thus, I want to see some excitement for it. Okay, that has been done. That's ready to go now. Let's get rid of this cutting board. And guys, we have this wet towel, so we can use it to just wipe off the station in just a second. Okie dokie. And I'm just gonna wipe all of this stuff off, guys, because we have this wet towel ready to go for us. Much better. That's a much better Yash Chef now that I'm seeing it come out. Okay, there you go. My whole table nice and beautiful and clean and ready to go now. And guys, I'm just gonna grab a glove and we're going to grab a bottle of olive oil. And remember, you cannot have this kind of food without a bunch of olive oil. This has Turkish inspiration, this has a lot of Mediterranean inspiration. You cannot have this kind of a salad without an absolute excess of olive oil to go ahead and lubricate everything beautifully. So it has the red wine vinegar inside already. We're going to get a bunch of this olive oil in now and then a bunch of freshly ground black pepper, everybody is to go ahead and season up the salad. Again, we have enough salt from the cheese, from the tomatoes, from the olives. Okay, bunch of black pepper, guys. Let's season this bad boy. Let's season it, let's season it, let's season it. And now it is time for us to mix the salad, the red peppers, the onions, the olives, the cheese, everything coming together in harmony, in unison for this incredible salad. Full of flavor, full of strong flavors. It is dyed absolutely red with all of that red pepper and a tomato and then like a little burst of green from the parsley. The white contrast from the cheese. So much texture, so much flavor. Everything combined and in love. Beautiful. Look at the salad, my friends. Look at the salad. Look at this salad. Just get all of those clusters broken up, get everything nicely combined. It is mixing great. That's why I wanted to, you know, give this so much setup. It's got all that parsley, all those different vegetables, everything inside, my friends. It is full of cheese. It's full of oil. We're not crushing anything. We're just gently lifting it. This is what salad is supposed to be. That's right, and a chopped salad nonetheless. No big pieces, only chopped and processed. And we're ready to go all the way from the bottom, just lift it up and let it all lay in. That, my friends, is a proper beautiful salad. All these vegetables, all that cheese, all of that oil, that is exactly what I am talking about. Perfect. And now guys, let's go ahead and plate up. Grab a little bowl for the salad, grab a bigger bowl for the soup. That bowl's a little too big for the soup. Okay, and I'm gonna get myself a nice gorgeous ladle, just one ladle for myself at the moment, because the soup is really rich and I had also a massive lunch today. Okay, that's my soup. And then I probably could have done some herbs on top, but ah, can't bother. And then guys, let's go ahead and get some of this gorgeous salad inside as well. Oof. Roasted bread cubes, so sparkless. Uh, my issue there is that they'll get soggy in the fridge. The reason why I made this kind of a salad is because this holds well in the fridge. So some croutons would be really nice, but um, maybe like only immediately after. My friends, we have done it. We have completed everything that we need to. This is my gorgeous, delicious salad. Let's go with the salad first. First, cherry tomatoes, we salted it to get rid of the excess liquid. Red onions that we went ahead and we soaked in vinegar to get rid of the pungency. We chopped up a bunch of mervi, this Turkish uh, sheep's cheese, really, really pungent, really funky. A bunch of chopped up parsley, some fresh, um, you know, some olives, some Kalamata olives that we went ahead and we just chopped up and put inside as well, and some red peppers. So we got tomatoes, we got peppers, we got onions, we got cheese, we got parsley, and we got olives in that bad boy. 
And then my friends, this is my gorgeous, beautiful butternut squash soup. This guy right here, we roasted some butternut squash and carrots. We sauteed lovingly some onions and celery and a bunch of olive oil. We added in fennel seed, cumin seed, um, coriander seed as well. We blended it all together with some half and half. Gorgeous. Silky and smooth and delicious. Everybody, let's have a little sip of the soup. Mm. Mm. And with some white wine in there too. Flavorful and sweet and creamy. It has so much flavor from the spices that we added to it. That is pretty remarkable. Also, Sparkus, thank you so much for the prime sub. Thank you, thank you. Mm. Super good, super delicious. And then guys, let's just try some of the salad. I don't care that I'm using the same spoon, such as life. Mm. Damn, that's good. There is so much texture, there is so much flavor. This is a peak fridge salad. This is the kind of a thing that you make in the beginning of the week and then you eat every single day on your lunches. That is just how good this kind of a salad is. Full of vegetables, full of flavor, full of cheese. Mm. Beautiful. So flavorful. Mm. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's it. That is it for you today, everybody. We are officially done with the cooking show today. We stream every single Wednesday, every single Friday, every single Sunday, 5 p.m. EDT. Everybody, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate every single one of you. Please check out my Patreon. You can type an exclamation mark Patreon in the chat. You can scroll down. You can go into the about section if you would like. Um, that is a really nice way of supporting the streams. I would love to be able to do these full time at some point. Next stream is in two days time, Sunday, 5 p.m. EDT. You know where to find me, twitch.tv slash Guardian. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being with me along this turbulent ride, but we did it. We pulled through to the other side. We pulled through to the end. I appreciate every single one of you. I hope you all have a safe Friday night. Go out, go have fun, go live your lives. Um, be responsible, be safe, make something delicious. Join my Discord. If you'd like exclamation like Discord as well, um, if you'd want to join the community and just hang out with people and talk with people, um, we have a lovely community that's thriving and growing, so make sure to go ahead and do that. And guys, we will be on out of here. Thank you all. Have a good night and see you Sunday, 5 p.m. EDT. Bye.